Our whole show is based on looking back and considering how some of the most popular cartoons were produced and what that meant for the people who were making them and watching them at the time. This is a compilation of several of those episodes assembled as a longer video that allows us to take a look back at the videos we made and consider them together in an efficient, easy to consume package. Take a break and come with us as we assemble the stories of some of your favorite afternoon adventures from action to adventure, robots and lasers, heroes and villains, the best and worst that animated humanity has to offer. Throw it on in the background while you dust your toy collection, let it play while you rearrange your comic books, keep your PJs on, grab a bowl of cereal, and have fun with the Afternoon Cartoons compilation. Partly metal, partly real, basically Thundercats, but with flying cyborg space cops instead of cat people, and oh so shiny. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Silver. Silverhawks starts with Rankin Bass Productions. You know Rankin Bass as the people who made all the classic stop motion holiday specials like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, The Year Without a Santa Claus, and lots of others. They also released an adaptation of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit in 1977 and Return of the King in 1980. In 1985, they continued their streak of children's television entertainment successes with Thundercats. Thundercats rolled out as a multimedia franchise complete with toys, comics, stuffed animals, pajamas, and a live-action stage show. In 1986, Thundercats entered its second season, joined by Silverhawks. Silverhawks was an attempt to do everything they just did with Thundercats, again, practically, almost literally. Thundercats and Silverhawks were so closely tied together that several voice actors performed multiple characters on both shows. They had a similar concept by the same production team, a similar visual design aesthetic, the same composer. The only thing Silverhawks was missing was a second, third, and fourth season. God. <laughs> Silverhawks takes place way in the future in another galaxy called Limbo where, you know what? Just don't go there. Nothing good happens there. It's so plagued by crime that they have an entire planet that's just one big jail. Lots of criminals in a big jail must mean that there is some kind of law enforcement and that is where the Silverhawks come in. Although technically they're more like a vigilante superhero force, but they are led by a guy who is actually an ex-cop. A long time ago, just two days before retirement, Commander Stargazer had part of his body cybernetically altered to withstand the rigors of intergalactic space travel. And this is a good time to talk about the difference between a cyborg, an android, and a robot. Cyborg is short for cybernetic organism. There has to be at least some organic parts involved. An android is a mechanical creature that has a humanoid form, whether entirely mechanical or partly organic. A robot is 100% mechanical. In summary, some cyborgs are androids, all androids are robots, and it's pronounced data, not data. Intergalactic space travel taxes a squishy body. Lots of pressure changes, gravity fluctuations, sometimes there's no air, and it's going to take like 300 years to get from one place to the other, so human guts need to be left behind. Becoming a cyborg is a testament to Stargazer's commitment to find and imprison Monstar, the worst criminal mob boss in all the galaxies. The only mistake Stargazer made after imprisoning him was preventing Monstar from being exposed to the rays of the Moonstar, which allowed Monstar to change from Monstar into Monstar. Monstar breaks out a prison planet, sets up a new base spitting distance from the Moonstar, and proceeds to get the old gang back together to take out Stargazer and his orbiting Tower of Justice, Hawk Haven, once and for all. Commander Stargazer knows he's getting too old for this shit. You're gonna take that out, right? Places an order to Earth for a new batch of Silverhawks. The cyborg program has improved a bit since Stargazer had his work done. Silverhawks are now nearly fully cybernetic androids with retractable wings, face masks, they have built-in lasers, and are capable of self-sustained spaceflight. Quicksilver, the leader, is the silverest of the hawks. His partner, Tallyhawk, is a partly metal, partly bird service animal that provides him with the ability to see things beyond the capability of his own senses. Sight uh, beyond sight, if you will. Steel Will and Steel Heart, fraternal twin brother and sister, are the muscle and mechanical experts of the group. Bluegrass is the cowboy hat wearing, electric guitar laser shoot, and pilot of the Silverhawk spaceship, the Mirage. And Copper Kid is the youngest and the smartest and totally incapable of speaking in anything other than whistles and clicks. Like Thundercats before them, Silverhawks landed with LJN toys, or did they? No. They didn't. LJN skipped Silverhawks. 1986 was a really busy year for them. They already had Thundercats. They were in the second year of their way too realistic motorized squirt guns called Entertech. They had expanded into home video games and they went all in on the real world arena-based laser tagging game market with Photon. 
Kenner Toys, who brought you Star Wars superpowers and masks, picked up the rights to the toys and produced a line of five inch scale action figures and vehicles that, while lacking in articulation, flourished with unique play features and vac metalized chrome finish on the Hawks themselves. The core Silver Hawks had cloth wings that they could open when they raised their arms out to the side after you squeezed their legs together. Monstar had a flipping head that changed him from Monstar to Monstar. Buzzsaw had blades that spun around when you pressed his head down. Each figure also came with a unique weapon slash bird accessory, Tally Hawk for Quicksilver, Sky Shadow for Monstar, Sideman for Bluegrass. Kenner also released the signature five cockpit Mirage space jet for the Silverhawks and some larger scale birds that created a play dynamic that put you in the position of controlling a near life-size Tally Hawk, Sky Shadow, or Stronghold. The animated series debuted in the United States late in 1986. Wave 1 arrived early in 1987. Wave 2 late in 1987. Season 1 would run in syndication through 1987 and into 1988 in some parts of the world. The last seven figures and Monstar Skyrunner saw limited release and are therefore today the rarest and most expensive items in the line. Marvel Comics, as part of its Star Comics imprint, briefly produced a Silverhawks comic book every other month starting in August of 1987 to keep the marketing effort rolling along, but only seven issues were published before it was canceled after the release of the August 1988 issue. Even though it only lasted one season, its association with the Thundercats and the cartoon and toy boom of the 80s still ranks it in pop culture history as a success. OJ. Bet there's OJ Joe rounding up oranges yeah. for Kellogg's, where they'll take the sweet juice and put it into new OJ's, a crunchy, delicious orange tasting cereal. Let's eat them up. That's one delicious orange taste, OJ. That's my brand. <laughs> OJ's are packed with vitamin C, part of this complete breakfast. New OJ, a oh. delicious orange tasting cereal. Pull them out. Looks like it's gonna be one of those days. After 7,000 years of smooth sailing, suddenly the three suns that orbit the planet have aligned. Now all of the technology has stopped functioning and everyone is sweaty because there are three suns and it is really hot outside and none of the air conditioners work anymore. But good news, the end of one era means the beginning of another. If science and technology can no longer get the job done, then magic will take its place. Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the History of Visionaries, Knights of the Magical Light. Stop me if you've heard this one before. 1980s collaborative project between Marvel Comics, Hasbro, and Sunbow Productions. G.I. Joe, Transformers, Robotics, Gem, and Humanoids. On second thought, don't stop me because we absolutely have been over this before. Cross-media marketing was a proven approach to selling a new toy line, a guaranteed way to make sure that the product stayed in the forefront of the target demographic as part of the consumable entertainment diet 24 hours a day. This isn't the first time this has come up, and it won't be the last. Visionaries was a 1987 effort by Hasbro to move a new, original concept line of action figures with a science fiction fantasy superhero theme. The figures, vehicles, and some weapons featured holograms that represented the bearer's magical power. See, on the planet Prismos, after the suns aligned, causing all the technology to fail, people suddenly had to interact with each other instead of binge-watching Netflix, subtweeting and Instagramming pictures of food, and it did not go well. The whole civilization went right back to medieval times. Instead of diners, drivers, and dives, they were building castles, moats, and labyrinths. Whatever solar force caused all the technology to fail also increased the amount of magic in the air. Two dominant competitive factions in the quest for more power emerged. The heroic Spectral Knights led by Leoric, and the evil Darkling Lords led by Darkstorm. Both the Knights and the Lords were invited to a contest held by the great and powerful wizard Merklin to compete for even greater magical powers. And then, like the total mischievous jerk wizard that he is, Merklin awarded an equal number of magical powers to both teams and then set them back into the world to make sure that the business of war and his own personal entertainment can continue in the absence of refrigerators and Beats by Dre. Their magical powers manifested themselves as spells contained within totem staves, chest plates, and panels on their vehicles. Each character could summon or fully shapeshift into the creature-based avatar represented on their chest plate. For Leoric, the leader of the Spectral Knights, it was a mighty lion. For Darkstorm, leader of the Darkling Lords, it was a swamp mollusk. 
Hasbro designed the figures using the same body engineering of their successful G.I. Joe line. Ball and socket neck, swivel biceps, o-ring waist, but visionaries were an inch taller preventing any crossover potential outside of the truly imaginative action figure enthusiast. You see, while the Joes were from Earth, the visionaries were not. That makes them aliens, and aliens aren't always the same height as humans. Another mystery solved. The animated series ran for 13 episodes from September to December of 1987. The cast was made up of some of the most recognizable, some of the biggest names in voice acting, several of whom had already worked on multiple Hasbro Marvel Sunbow projects together. Peter Cullen, Jim Cummings, Chris Latta, Neil Ross, stop me if you've heard them before. Marvel started a comic book series under their Star Comics imprint, but it only lasted six issues in the United States and suffered the indignity of being canceled two issues into a four-issue arc. Across the pond, the UK branch of Marvel, hoping to get some mileage out of what had already been produced, reprinted the Visionaries comics. But they performed even worse over there, making it only four issues before being recanceled. Hindsight is 2020, so it's easy for me to judge sitting here in the future. But it's almost as if this just wasn't a concept that kids from all over the world were into. But that didn't stop Marvel UK. The remaining two issues, five and six, were broken up and run as backup stories in Transformers comics that were rebranded Transformers and Visionaries. Maybe some of that Transformers magic would rub off on the Visionaries. Visionaries just weren't particularly successful on any of the marketing fronts. It's unfortunate because holograms are totally cool and mesmerizing, and it's not the worst possible premise for a toy line that uses them. But after their brief flirtation with mass retail, Visionaries would go silent until 2015, when they were announced as part of the Hasbro shared universe. In 2015, Hasbro started developing a crossover universe with several of their prominent 80s brands and also some obscure ones. Mask, Transformers, G.I. Joe, Rom, Action Man, Micronauts, and Visionaries. Maybe Gem? Sometimes Gem? We'll see. In fact, we'll see about all of it. Aiming high with a series of movies, starting low with a series of comics. Most of that shared universe world building was handled by the creative teams at IDW Comics, where they produced several books featuring the Hasbro brands from 2015 through 2017. But regardless of what IDW did with those brands up to now, it's all going to get rebooted if and when any of the films can actually make it to theaters. To celebrate the announcement of potential return of visionaries in the Hasbro shared universe in 2016, Hasbro released a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive Leoric Mighty Mugs figure. While fans were happy to see their favorite mustachioed Spectral Knight back in product form, they were not happy with the foil sticker that had replaced the signature hologram on his chest. A year later in 2017, still celebrating the potential for the return of the Visionaries brand, Hasbro released a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive box set tied into the IDW comic book crossover series. It featured Transformers, Micronauts, G.I. Joe, Action Man, Mask, and Leoric from Visionaries, finally in scale with G.I. Joe, and again, disappointing fans with foil stickers instead of holograms. The Visionaries made their biggest impact to date when IDW's Transformers vs. Visionaries hit shelves in January of 2018. Merging the Visionaries concept with the world of Transformers was easy since they are originally set on different planets, Cybertron and Prismos. In this version of the future, the three sons of Prismos de-align, causing cataclysmic destruction of the planet, killing all but a handful of the Visionaries. Merklin and the Visionaries start to build a new home on Cybertron, where the Dark Lords see the Transformers as mere objects, and the Spectral Knights recognize them as sentient beings. Even with so few Visionaries remaining, they still can't come together, and so the war continues. The Visionaries all received modern redesigns, so from here on out, they demand to be taken seriously. Whether Visionaries sounds like something you're into or not, give Hasbro credit. In the 80s, they were creating original properties left and right. They were trying new things. They were pushing the boundaries of what might attract kids, what might get them to spend their parents' money. And if nothing else, it means that no matter how obscure the property, Hasbro will never give up on it, even if one fan still remembers. You could sell your new toy line by standing outside your factory and shouting at passers-by. That is the minimum amount of effort. Or you could create a new pop icon, tap into a snapshot cultural moment that marries adventure, excitement, glamour and glitter, fashion and fame, write, record and produce 151 unique songs cut into three music videos per episode of a cartoon that runs for three seasons while inspiring and sustaining a global fan base for decades. Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the history of Gem and the Holograms.
Gem and the Holograms was a three-season, 65-episode animated series that originally ran from October of 1985 to 1988 in various formats. It was a joint production of Hasbro Marvel Productions and Sunbow Entertainment, the production team that was responsible for some of the most successful cartoons based on toys to sell toys based on cartoons. G.I. Joe, Transformers and Humanoids, Robotics, Bigfoot and the Muscle Machines, all right, they didn't bat a thousand, but they stepped up and kept swinging at pitches. Even the best performers aren't going to get a hit every time. A 300 average still gets you some Hall of Fame votes. Jem and the Holograms is the story of one of the most popular recording artists in the world, Jem and her band The Holograms, and her actual secret identity, recording company executive Jerrica Benton. Jerrica uses the popularity, fame, and most importantly, fortune of Jem and the Holograms to fund the Starlight Foundation, a charity that sustains an orphanage called Starlight House. Jerrica's transformation from mild-mannered record industry mogul and charity administrator into mega pop star Jem is accomplished with the help of a supercomputer slash artificial intelligence called Synergy that can project and maintain lifelike holographic images on and around her via her Gemstar earrings. The Gemstar earrings, Synergy, the Starlight Foundation, and Starlight Music were all left to her by her father after his death. Gem and the holograms are frequently... Frequently. <laughs> frequently. Gem and the holograms are frequently... Uh, that's a tough word. Frequently. I'll get it this time. Frequently. Gem and the Holograms are frequently pitted against music rivals The Misfits, their label Misfits Music, and its owner Eric Raymond. Eric was a business associate to Jerrica's father at Starlight Music and could have been owner of Starlight Music, except he left everything to his daughters, Jerrica and Kimber. Jerrica, as Gem, uses the powers of synergy to put on the best stage performance you've ever seen to maintain the profitability of the record label and, most importantly, ensure that the Starlight Foundation will continue to provide orphaned girls a place to live, learn, and be a part of a family. Gem began life as a series of 15 seven-minute shorts, part of a Sunbow Marvel Productions partnership called Super Week, sometimes called Super Sunday, sometimes called Super Saturday. The half-hour series featured four different animated series in a kind of pilot program intended to test out properties before ordering a whole season. Gem and Humanoids, Robotics, and Bigfoot and the Muscle Machines all got their start on Super Saturday, also called Super Sunday. Gem would prove to be the most popular, making it to a full season with those initial shorts recut as the first five episodes of the series. The basic concept for the line of dolls was conceived of by Bill Sanders and Barbara and Joe Highland. Hasbro, as Hasbro does, developed a marketing plan to introduce the mythology and showcase the dolls through an animated series and a multitude of other supporting merchandise. Sleeving bags, puzzles, lunchboxes, board games, sticker albums. Hasbro had already made successful multimedia brands out of Transformers, G.I. Joe, and My Little Pony. Gem was next in the spotlight. Gem and the Holograms was a production of Sunbow Entertainment, an animation studio owned by Griffin Bacall, advertising a frequent partner of Marvel Productions. Marvel Productions president and CEO at the time was Margaret Loesch, who had worked for ABC and NBC in production roles, and then later as executive vice president of children's programming at Hanna-Barbera. In the 90s, she would go on to Fox Kids during a run of television that introduced the X-Men and Batman animated series and the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. That is a Hall of Fame record. Christy Marks created the story bible for Gem based on the rough photos of prototype toys provided to her by Hasbro while they were in production. Christy was the head writer and developer for all three seasons of Gem, writing 23 of the 65 episodes herself. She had a prolific resume as an animation writer, including many of your favorites beginning in the late 70s with the Fantastic Four through Spider-Man, Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, G.I. Joe, and Captain Power. And then after Gem, she would work on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Dino Riders, G.I. Joe again, Bucky O'Hare, Conan, Babylon 5, Transformers, Beast Wars, X-Men Evolution, Biker Mice from Mars. She's your favorite writer that you never knew you loved so much. That matters because Hasbro wanted a show that would appeal to both girls and boys, or at the very least had just enough action and adventure, science fiction and spectacle that boys wouldn't immediately change the channel. Christy Marks had the knowledge and experience to deliver it all. Jim! Gem's wardrobe and Gem and her friends sold separately. Gem! 
Gemma and Jerrica's speaking voices were both performed by Samantha Newark, who even at the age of 18 already had a burgeoning career as both a singer and actor in commercials for brands like McDonald's and Payless Shoes. On the singing side, Jem was played by 21-year-old Britta Phillips, whose audition performance of the main theme song was so good that her actual audition recording was used for the final animation. Of course, the goal was always to sell the toys. Hasbro's line of Jem dolls, including Jem and Jerrica, Holograms members Aja, Kimber, Shanna, Road Manager, and Love Triangle third Rio, Misfits, Pizzazz, Stormer, and Roxy, it was a strong, stylish line packed with gimmicks that helped it stand apart from Mattel's Barbie THE fashion doll since the 1950s. But Mattel didn't just want to sit and watch the show from the audience. Barbie was used to being solo in the spotlight. Barely a year into the world of Jem, Mattel initiated a battle of the bands in the toy aisle. Jem and the Holograms had to prove themselves the superior act time and time again on TV against the Misfits. The real world would have them squaring off against Barbie and the Rockers. Barbie, who had been everything from a teenage fashion model to teacher to astronaut to... Well, a musician put together a band to try to beat Jem at her own game, at her only game, specifically appealing to the MTV generation with music, fashion, and video production. The basic premise of Jem as a product was somewhat limited. Jem couldn't take on all the different roles that a doll like Barbie could. She was kind of locked into her role as mega pop star and recording company executive. She could change outfits, but Barbie could change genres. It was a challenging competition that helped and hurt both companies' sales. Jem burned bright and fast. It was the number one nielsen rank syndicated cartoon in November of 1986, still in the top three in 1987, and despite lagging toy sales in 1987, the cartoon continued into 1988 before both the toy line and show were canceled. Fans of Jem and the Holograms would be abandoned by Hasbro for a very long time. The first glimmer of hope for any kind of revival would be in 2011, with Jem being rebroadcast on various networks like USA and The Hub Network. That same year, Shout Factory released the complete series on DVD. And Hasbro began teasing the concept of a shared Hasbroverse in a one-shot comic released at San Diego Comic-Con called Unit E. The very short comic featured several Hasbro brands like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Micronauts, Battleship, Candyland, Mask, Stretch Armstrong, Action Man, as well as Synergy and Jerrica pre-Gem. In 2012, Integrity Toys acquired a gem license from Hasbro to produce a very limited run of modern gem dolls with entirely new sculpts. The dolls sold out immediately and Integrity began producing more characters and more outfits. By 2017, they produced over 50 different dolls with more characters and outfits than the original line had ever been able to produce. From 2015 to 2017, IDW Comics published a new gem comic book series written by Kelly Thompson and illustrated by Sophie Campbell. While there are no direct depictions of gem as a part of the shared Hasbro IDW universe, technically, they are part of the same world if and when it becomes necessary. Let's not close any cross-promotional marketing opportunities before they've been explored. In 2015, Jem finally made her grand return to the pop culture spotlight as a full-length, feature-length, live-action-length feature film directed by John M. Chu. Let it roll. <laughs> Chu was the natural choice for Hasbro, having just directed two different Justin Bieber concert films, Never Say Never in 2011 and Believe in 2013. And in 2013, he also directed G.I. Joe Retaliation widely considered to be a film about Hasbro's line of G.I. Joe action figures. Gem and the Holograms was released to theaters on October 23, 2015. Chu, a fan of Gem since childhood, served as a producer on the film, a dream project for him as a creator. He had been working to bring the film to life for nearly a decade, much to the chagrin of Gem creator Christy Marks and anyone who had been involved with the original animated series that were not offered the opportunity to develop the film as well. Chu delivered a film that was essentially Jem reimagined through the lens of Justin Bieber, Hannah Montana, and the modern world of overnight viral social media stardom, minus the science fiction elements of holographic projections that were the gimmick of the original character's creation. He also confirmed his intent to bring the Hasbro shared universe together with G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Jem. And as hard as it is to believe, none of that helped the performance at the box office. After just two weeks in theaters grossing a scant $2.2 million, less than half of its $5 million budget, Jem was pulled from theaters. I don't know much about brand revitalization and reboot marketing strategies, but I gotta believe that's not going to help get Jem ready for her 35th anniversary in 2021. Hardcore fans had a much more positive reaction to the 30-minute fan film released in 2018 by YouTube channel Chickbait called Truly Outrageous. 
Integrity Toys' last gem doll was released in 2017, and they have become very expensive on the secondary market. IDW has hinted at the potential to bring Gem back again for more comics, and however weird it seems, there is also the potential for a Hasbro shared universe to get rolling, especially after the renewed life in the Transformers brand after the Bumblebee movie. Nearly 35 years later, Gem and the Hologram still has a very dedicated fan base, still waiting to celebrate to the degree that G.I. Joe, Transformers, and My Little Pony fans have been able to. In this era of reboots and remakes, the wait time to try again after a failed attempt is getting shorter and shorter. With any luck, we're closer to the next thing than the last thing. I like the way we're gonna make your day. We like to make Zare your store. Zare knows when you come in for an advertised item, you want to find that item. So we're going to try to keep our shelves stocked. Come along and say that Zare. If we have to give you a rain check, we'll give you an extra 10% off when you come in to pick it up. We'd like to make Zare your store. They were all out, right? Ta-da! We'd like to make Zare your store. I just made Zare my store. <laughs> Everyone's heard of the circle of life. This is about the triangle of life. Comic books, cartoons, and action figures. Once established, each feeding into the marketing of the other, increasing visibility, building value, fueling the growth, development, expansion of the other. This is about the continuing legacy of the brand that did it first and did it best. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero is an animated series, comic books, and action figure line, a three-sided marketing and sales approach that began in 1982 that made such a significant cultural impact that the effects can still be seen today, nearly 40 years later. G.I. Joe was originally introduced by Hasbro in the 1960s, the boys' toys answer to the success that Mattel was having with Barbie. He was America's movable fighting man, the first action figure, a huge success for over a decade until 12-inch figures and terrestrial war itself briefly fell out of fashion. But as the 80s approached, Hasbro sought to bring one of their most successful brands back to the front. Bob Prupis, head of Boys Toys, was in charge of Operation Blastoff, the top secret product development project that would find a way to reinvent G.I. Joe for the new decade. Bob went back to the most basic idea of toy soldiers that he could think of, the simple green plastic army men that he and most kids had played with growing up. And it would have been irresponsible not to try to combine that concept with the success that Kenner was having with their three and three quarter inch Star Wars figures and vehicles. Kenner had already made the move to a smaller line of figures for two reasons. One, thanks to the oil embargo of the 70s, the cost of oil was skyrocketing, which meant that the cost to produce plastic products was going up as well. It made financial sense to decrease the size and complexity of the toys to keep the price down. Two, smaller figures which were more cost efficient meant that vehicles and playsets, which naturally had a higher price point, could be produced more cost effectively as well. On top of that, G.I. Joe would be the dream combination of two toys that kids had already proved they liked playing with. Toy soldiers and toy cars. And tanks and jets and boats and motorcycles. Upper management wasn't initially sold on the new smaller Joes. It wasn't exciting enough, but that didn't deter Bob and his staff. They kept working, trying to find the version that Hasbro would put a real investment into. In 1981, Bob got together with Hasbro's marketing agency, Griffin Bacall, to kick ideas around. With Kirk Bozigian and designers Ron Rudat and Greg Bernstein, the team resolved to find a way to make G.I. Joe work for the new era, to do something different to create excitement and move this potential new toy line. Kenner had feature films to sell their Star Wars toys. Hasbro wasn't going to make a movie to sell a line that had been dead for several years. And not for nothing, but there was no existing mythology to produce a movie around anyway. The next best option at the time, the next best way to reach that same target audience and tell stories was comic books. Griffin McCall's other partner, Marvel Comics, had already produced comic books based on toy lines like Shogun Warriors and Micronauts. Marvel was ideal to provide the mythology building necessary to engage the audience and create an emotional connection to the toys. On top of that, producing comics was going to be much cheaper and faster than making a movie, TV show, or even an animated series. With the goal of reaching the widest audience possible, Marvel was particularly excited by the idea of comic books being advertised on TV. Unlike toys, there were no rules and regulations about marketing comics to kids on television. Toy commercials had to meet all sorts of standards with respect to runtime, broadcast time, limitations on animation, depictions of the actual functions of the toys, and demonstrations with actual kids playing with the toys. 
Griffin McCall budgeted $3 million for a series of fully animated commercials that would technically promote the continuing adventures of G.I. Joe in the Marvel comics, but would also obviously showcase the variety of toys that would be available on store shelves at the time. In the triangle of life, each side depends on and feeds the others. This is a triangle. Hasbro and Marvel hit the toy shelves and the comic book racks while the 30 second spots ran on TV introducing the concepts of the battle between good and evil, the Joes versus Cobra, each commercial teasing the next adventure which would feature new characters or vehicles that were included in the line. In 1982, Hasbro released 13 G.I. Joe characters squared off against Cobra Commander and two Army Builder figures, a Cobra Officer and a rank-and-file Cobra Trooper. To help reinforce the stories in the comics, each figure featured a file card on the back of the package with classified information detailing everything about the character from birthplace to military specialties and endorsements from senior officers. It added another layer of collectability to a toy line already compelling kids to collect them all. Hasbro conservatively estimated $12 to $15 million in sales in the first year of the line, backed by the comics and television advertising. However, in a world without Transformers, with a year to go until the release of Return of the Jedi, G.I. Joe soared to over $50 million in sales, becoming the must-have toys of the holiday season in 1982. Hasbro, Marvel, Griffin Bacall, it was clear to everyone that this wasn't just a popular toy line, but had the potential to be a pop culture phenomenon, and the time to take advantage was now. Hasbro and Griffin Bacall set out to find some legitimate screenwriters to bring over to the world of kids' animation, normally a place where they would have to retire to once they were all washed up. Ron Friedman, who had worked on shows like Happy Days, The Andy Griffith Show, and Bewitched, had some ideas. In other words, a pilot of one 22-minute episode is not going to sell G.I. Joe. I suggested a five-part miniseries. So the kids would have time, and I would have time, to introduce groupings of characters and establish the families, because the family is the touchstone of all storytelling, of all drama. Ron gave a particular voice to the characters with the introduction of both the yo Joe and Cobra battle cries. He established the archetypes for the characters and how the different teams worked together. All of this in the interest of creating a compelling animated series that would build on the style and tone already established by the visuals in the commercials. As part of their marketing offerings, Griffin McCall maintained an animation production wing called Sunbow Productions. Sunbow wrote the scripts based on the reference material provided to them by Hasbro. Sunbow worked directly with Marvel Productions, the film and television wing of Marvel Entertainment Group. Marvel Productions handled the storyboards and voice casting and then subcontracted the actual animation out to Toei Animation. It would be an understatement to say that there were a lot of moving parts involved in bringing this animated series to life. Everything began in 1983 with G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, a five-episode miniseries. It aired from September 12th to the 16th in 1983 on 122 stations. The plot centered on Cobra's creation of a teleporter called the Mass Device. It could be used to, say, steal a communication satellite, deploy an entire army of troops, or destroy the Earth's core. Both the Joes and Cobra attempted to collect the rare elements to power their respective mass devices before the other was able to. Ultimately, the show did exactly what it intended to, introduce the mythology of the world of G.I. Joe in a visually compelling way with all the drama that animated television can provide. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, the miniseries, would again exceed projections, scoring ratings that were better than those charted by the most popular Saturday morning cartoons. It would be followed by a second miniseries in 1984 called G.I. Joe, The Revenge of Cobra, with a similar plot device to the original series, wherein the Joes and Cobras have to locate all the parts of the Weather Dominator weapon before the opposition. And the success of that series would lead into the creation of an ongoing series in September of 1985. The first full season of G.I. Joe began with the rebroadcast of the two previous five-part miniseries, both written by Ron Friedman. Fifty-five more episodes were produced to get the series to the 65-episode minimum needed for syndication, the first five of which were a third miniseries written by Ron Friedman called The Pyramid of Darkness. Like the previous series, it served as a means to introduce new characters and vehicles to the line, climaxing with all of the old and new characters joining together to fight against the old and new forces of Cobra. Once the regular daily episodes began, the shows would shuffle the focus through the ever-expanding roster of characters wherever an interesting script presented itself. Hasbro, Sunbow, Marvel, everyone knew the game that was being played. Selling more to kids is always a risky, albeit successful, business model. That said, steps were taken to minimize the degree of danger related to the war being depicted. 
Bullets were replaced by red and blue lasers. Vehicle drivers, fighter pilots especially, could always be seen successfully escaping before potentially perishing in the explosion. And in an attempt to provide some educational value, each episode of the regular series ended with a 30-second public service announcement where a member of the G.I. Joe team would assist kids in learning a lesson about safety. Of the multitude of ideas G.I. Joe brought into the public consciousness, the most impactful by far for the generation that grew up with it is the closing tagline of those PSAs. It is the call and answer, the mantra that unites the fan base. Whether it was learning what to do if you caught on fire or warning against petting strange animals, G.I. Joe was there to make sure you knew what to do. And knowing is half the battle. 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 1986 debuted the fourth five-part miniseries to kick off the next 30 episodes. It was the first attempt at a significant refresh of the line and the mythology. Arrived Arise, Serpentor Arise once again took the Joes and Cobras on missions to collect a series of MacGuffins. This time it was the DNA of history's greatest and most ruthless military leaders in an attempt to engineer a new leader for Cobra named Serpentor. <laughs> that was the best take. <laughs> And since we're on the subject, let's not overlook the fact that after four five-episode miniseries, the Joes have a terrible track record of preventing Cobra from accomplishing their missions. Cobra successfully collected all the parts for the mass device, they recovered all the pieces for the Weather Dominator, they activated the Pyramid of Darkness, and they successfully stole DNA from ancient graves and tombs to bring Serpentor to life. Yes, the Joes ultimately defeated Cobra in each scenario, but not until after valuable time and resources were expended, and one has to assume a major loss of life and property on both sides and civilians around the world. Yo, Joe, come on team, this is what you trained for. If you can't get the job done, you're going to get replaced. Ryan, got your new cereal. How's it look, Duke? All clear. Go for it. Hit it! Introducing G.I. Joe Action Stars brand cereal, a delicious part of this complete breakfast. Crunchy stars that taste great. So, for all you action stars... Bye, Mom! G.I. Joe! Action Stars! In 1987, the first G.I. Joe feature-length film was released direct-to-home video, featuring an all-star cast with names like Burgess Meredith, Don Johnson, and Sergeant Slaughter. The original intent was to release to theaters, but after unexpected production delays pushed the film back, and the disappointing box office results of both the Transformers and My Little Pony movies, there was no other reasonable option. Transformers and My Little Pony had lost Hasbro a combined $10 million. That's enough to force Hasbro to cut costs on G.I. Joe and altogether kill the gem movie that was in development. G.I. Joe the movie would be cut up into the standard five-episode miniseries structure and broadcast later that year. The movie does exactly what the Transformers movie sought to do. Cycle out the old characters in favor of the new so the line can stay fresh and storylines can move forward. New concepts, new direction, new everything. While G.I. Joe had always had a science fiction angle to it, G.I. Joe the movie dives headfirst into the genre. Another move to potentially distance G.I. Joe from the realities of actual real-life war. G.I. Joe the movie tells the story of Cobra Law, an ancient snake-centric civilization, masters of biological technologies. The time has come for their re-emergence from the shadows. After 40,000 years in hiding, a brilliant young scientist, disfigured though he may be, is named Cobra Commander and given an army to wage war against the humans. The disgusting humans who dominate the planet with their lifeless, inorganic technology, with culture that offends the nobility of ancient Cobra law. Cobra's ranks are reinforced with new additions like Golobulus and Nemesis Enforcer. The Joes land new recruits Jinx, Tunnel Rat, Chuckles, Law and & Order, and Duke's own half-brother Falcon. And like the Transformers movie, G.I. Joe attempted to have some significant, lasting consequences. They attempted to introduce a genuine sense of danger to the series by actually killing off a major character. However, Hasbro was not happy about the negative reaction to the killing of Optimus Prime in the Transformers movie, so there was no way they were going to permanently kill off Duke, the longtime leader of the Joes. After a quick rewrite and a line of dialogue, Duke recovers from the snake Serpentor threw into his heart after a brief coma. After the movie, Marvel Productions made some more commercials for the Marvel comic books with an eye towards a third season which would have focused on a criminal organization called The Coil, led by Tomax and Zaymot, and Cobra Commander's attempt to rebuild Cobra as 
I don't know, he's some kind of talking snake commander or something. <laughs> Unfortunately, that third season would never happen. Marvel Productions lost the license to Deke Entertainment. The Deke Entertainment era of G.I. Joe Real American Hero began the same way the Marvel Productions era began, with a five-part miniseries called Operation Dragonfire. Right out of the gate, Operation Dragonfire reestablishes the key players, including the return of Cobra Commander and a slew of new characters and vehicles soon to be available in toy stores all over the country. The Deke era would last for two years from 1989 through 1991, a total of 44 episodes. While it is still the same continuity as the Sunbow era, everything was created uniquely for its run. While the cartoons were the biggest means of exposure, the comics had been there since the beginning and continued the entire time with a storyline that was, at times, aligned with the animated series, but for the most part, developed independent of the show. Different characters gained prominence in the comics versus the cartoon. Some characters' origins were completely different, but it gave Larry Hama, the writer for nearly every issue of the comic book and every file card in the toy line, the freedom to take the story wherever he wanted to. The comics were just as important to the legend of G.I. Joe as the toy line and animated series. The books provided the foundation for the toy line, and then the promotion set the stage for the animated series. The continued success of the cartoon and the toy line ensured the success of the comic book. G.I. Joe was unique among toy-centric comics at the time. There was no expectation that the toy line itself, much less the comic books, would last more than two or three years. G.I. Joe, a real American hero, lasted 12 years in its original run. It was the number one subscription book at Marvel for the year 1985. It served as an entry book to comics in general as kids migrated to other comics from G.I. Joe. Marvel sold over 150,000 copies of G.I. Joe per month in 1983. Thanks to the successful television marketing and the explosion of popularity through the animated series, that number jumped to 330,000 copies per month in 1985. That year, Marvel spun off a new title, G.I. Joe Yearbook, and then in 1986, G.I. Joe Special Missions. That same year, Marvel published G.I. Joe Order of Battle, a four-issue compilation of all the information from the file cards on the back of G.I. Joe action figures. And in 1987, the first four-issue crossover between G.I. Joe and Hasbro's other mega-hit toy line, The Transformers. G.I. Joe the Animated Series officially ended in 1992, leaving the action figure line support up to the comic book series. But times had changed, and most of the kids who had grown up with the line had moved on to other things. The comic book and the figure line would both end in 1994 after 155 issues and hundreds of action figures, vehicles, and playsets. G.I. Joe, a real American hero, and G.I. Joe the movie were released on VHS in the mid-80s. Arise, Serpentor Arise was released on Laserdisc in 1991. Season 1 and half of Season 2 were released on DVD by Kid Rhino Entertainment in 2003 and 2004. In 2008, Hasbro reacquired the worldwide distribution rights to the Sunbow era of cartoons. As part of the 25th anniversary relaunch of the toy line, a DVD of each of the five-part miniseries were packed in with a themed set of figures. In 2009, Shout Factory re-released a complete collector's set, 17 DVDs with all 95 episodes of the Sunbow era. The set features a ton of bonus features, including toy commercials and a 60-page book. Today, most of the series is streaming for free at TubiTV.com. This version of G.I. Joe helped to solidify the importance of the transmedia narrative approach to marketing toys, multiple media formats telling parts of an overall story, each making the other more valuable, permeating every aspect of the entertainment experience, making the brand virtually inescapable. It's the version of G.I. Joe that has been repeatedly called back to duty by the fans who connected with it at the most receptive time of their lives. It is the version that established the characters that transcended their role in the mythology to become pop culture touchstones. It's the version that inspired live-action feature films in 2009 and 2013, comic book series from Devil's Due Publishing and IDW Comics, and even a return to the original continuity with original writer Larry Hama 16 years after the original comic book series was cancelled. And just the other day, Henry Golding was added to the cast for a Snake Eyes movie currently pushed back to 2020 from 2019, from 2018, from 2017. Whether or not he will be playing Snake Eyes is still unknown, or at least I couldn't figure it out. I'm not even sure there's a real script yet. Is this the one with Chuckles, or is that another thing? G.I. Joe, a real American hero, was a rare reboot that was more successful than the property it was based on, with characters gaining global recognition and popularity in excess of what they had been for decades before. It impacted the lives of a generation of kids for over a decade, and even managed to communicate a message of diversity, hope, and unity through the lens of a war against terror while selling a whole lot of toys and comic books.
The never-ending struggle between good and evil is fought on many battlefields and takes many forms. Victory hinges on adaptability. Technological superiority is key, yes, but nothing is more important than the element of surprise. And that goes for designing and marketing a toy line as well. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Mask. We have previously covered elements of the history of Mask in an outdated format called 10 Things You Need to Know. While it allowed us to present a brief overview of Mask in general, it also skipped a lot of basic stuff. We're revisiting it here to fill out the details and paint a more comprehensive picture of a line that, with any luck, is on its way back. Someday. Mask is an action figure and vehicle toy line produced by Kenner, supported by an animated series, comic books, and lots of other licensed merchandise. It follows the adventures of the Mobile Armored Strike Command and their battle against Venom, the vicious evil network of mayhem. Look, I don't know a lot about branding per se, but I gotta give it to both of these squads for just leaning into and embracing what they are, not settling for anything less than clear, explicit descriptions of the services they offer in easy to remember acronyms. Both teams are fully stocked with cutting edge technology, allowing their vehicles to shift shapes, unlocking additional functionality. A motorcycle becomes a helicopter, a Jeep becomes a boat, a car becomes a car with the doors open and enough thrust to make it fly in the face of every known law of physics. The masks the show is named after are the helmets worn by each member of both Mask and Venom. None of the characters have cool code names like Maverick or Iceman. That's right, Ice Man. I am dangerous. Rather, they are called by their regular names, and their helmets have code word activated powers. Miles Mayhem, the leader of Venom, wears a Viper with the power of acid squirting and poison blasting. Matt Tracker, the leader of Mask, utilizes Spectrum, a mask with the power of plot contrivance. Flight, energy creation, energy absorption, energy redirection, wrote yourself into a corner, deadline approaching, missed your payment date, Spectrum will save the day. Mask hit the shelves for the first time in 1985, the biggest year in American pop culture ever. You needed to put out a strong original product if you were going to survive. It was a very crowded market that put heavy demands on a 10-year-old kid's time and their parents' wallets. At theaters, Back to the Future, Goonies, Rocky IV, Breakfast Club, Reanimator, on television, Thundercats, Robotech, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Growing Pains, MacGyver, Nintendo hit the U.S., The Hole in the Ozone Layer, New Coke, Calvin and Hobbes, Blockbuster is Born, Hypodermics on the Shore, Rock and Roller, Color Wars, and the toy shelves were stocked with Star Wars, Transformers, G.I. Joe, and He-Man stuff. From 1985 to 1988, Kenner released four full waves of vehicles, action figures, small accessory sets, and one giant playset. The transforming vehicles were the focus of the line. That's why the figures are so tiny. Boulder Hill was big as it was and would have been huge if it was a three and three quarter inch line or larger. For the first two years of that toy line, it was supported by a 75 episode animated series produced by Deke Entertainment, which itself was supported by one of the most valuable assets a cartoon could possibly have, music by Haim Saban and Shuki Levy. Saban and Levy produced music for tons of 80s and 90s shows, theme songs that don't stop a rockin', Masters of the Universe, Inspector Gadget, Ulysses 31, Pole Position, Robocop, Jason the Wheeled Warriors, The Real Ghostbusters, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and lots of others. Season one premiered September of 1985 and ran for 65 of those 75 episodes, telling 86% of the core story, building the world of Mask, but more importantly, establishing the play structure. There's a lot of back and forth between Mask and Venom in those first 65 episodes. A lot of thwarted plans, new vehicles, new masks, new characters cycled in and out. A whole lot of lasers, missiles, and money spent developing new technologies to surprise each other with more lasers and missiles. And then, for the second season, the last 10 episodes, they cut the nonsense and just started racing each other. But the story was told from several angles. The cartoons were just one part of the effort to build the mythology. See. In the beginning, there was no Mask and Venom, just one single operation dedicated to building a better, safer world through science. Miles Mayhem and the Tracker brothers, Matt and Andy, developed both the vehicle transformation and powered helmet technologies. Acting anonymously as secret protectors of the world wasn't enough for Miles. He stole half the goods, torched the facility, and left Andy Tracker for dead, who then actually died. That part of the origin of Mask and Venom was told through one of the three mini-comics that were included with the toys early in the line. DC Comics also began publishing Mask in December of 1985 with a four-issue limited series that ran through March of 1986. That was followed by a nine-issue regular series in 1987. There were some international releases in the UK by Grand Dreams, including hardcover annuals. Did that sound natural? <laughs> Start over. 
There were some international releases in the UK by Grand Dreams, including hardcover annuals. Fleetway, another UK publisher, released an entire mask magazine that ran 80 issues. It existed as its own continuity outside everything else that was being published in the United States. While they weren't the most popular games of their time, while some people might be finding out about them right now, there was a selection of computer games released in 1987 and 1988 by the British publisher Gremlin Graphics. Mask, Mask 2, and Mask 3 Venom Strikes Back varied to the degree in which they utilized the license for visuals or storytelling purposes, technology limited gameplay to mostly scrolling shooters and simple puzzle solving. That said, for the most part, the games got good reviews from people who owned the appropriate platforms, Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC. I don't know what any of those are. Can you hack the mainframe with them? <laughs> Mask, where illusion is the ultimate weapon. Get ready for an attack on Boulder Hill. Prepare for battle. This is no innocent petrol station. Activate freeze ray. No one stops the evil Jack Hammer from finishing his mission. Oh yeah? Boom! I'll sneak in another way. Got me! Surrender, prisoner! Boulder Hill, where illusion is the ultimate weapon. And see the mask comic at your newsagent now. More than half of Mask the Animated Series was released on a series of VHS tapes by Kiddio Video. On top of that, four season two racing episodes were edited together to make a feature length film called Mask the Movie, which was followed by four more season two episodes edited together to make a sequel called Mask the Movie 2. In 2011, Shout Factory released all 65 Season 1 episodes on DVD as The Complete Series. Season 2 wasn't part of that licensing, so you'll have to stick to the VHS editions of the movies for the full story on all the racetrack-related mischief, or, you know, watch it here on YouTube. Kenner released the last Mask Toys in 1988, and in 1991, Kenner was consumed whole by Hasbro, allowing Hasbro to add all of Kenner's essence to their own, making a stronger hybrid Super Hasbro that would be poised to recycle every property both companies ever produced for the next 30 years, and the 30 years after that, Hasbro till all are one. In 1997, Kenner, as part of Hasbro, released a line of toys called Vortec Undercover Conversion Squad. In terms of mythology, there was no connection to Mask, but one look at the toys and the transforming vehicle gimmick suggested that some of the molds for Mask vehicles were being used in the new product with a similar scale and play pattern. For more about the oddity that was Vortec, be sure to check out our video, Vortec, the Forgotten Mask Sequel slash Ripoff. In 2008, Hasbro snuck Matt Tracker into their 25th anniversary G.I. Joe line, getting me and everyone else at MattTracker.com really excited. I mean, you don't just throw that out there just because, right? There must have been a plan. Tracker on the Joes, Mayhem on the Cobras, Biff Bang Pow spin off the 25th anniversary mask line in 2010. That never happened, but in 2011, Mask was included in a New York Comic Con one-shot comic called Unit E. It was intended to be a big shared universe thing involving Mask, Micronauts, Action Man, Gem, and of course, Battleship. Mask was ever so slightly altered to be more of a law enforcement group set in Detroit, but other than a tease, nothing ever resulted from it. No more toys, comics, nothing. In 2016, IDW released a Hasbro Universe crossover entitled Revolution. It featured characters from Transformers, Mask, Action Man, Micronauts, and G.I. Joe, and ROM. Some changes were made to characters' appearances, backstories, costumes, vehicles, and Mask itself was spun off into its own series for 10 issues, topping its previous ongoing series record of nine. It wouldn't be the last time the Mask operatives would deploy. They would return in 2017 as part of IDW's follow-up crossover series, First Strike, One Shot, and Six Issue Limited Series, which was the last time they would deploy. In 2007, Hasbro scored huge success with the Transformers live-action movie. It was followed in 2009 by not only another Transformers movie, but also a G.I. Joe movie. Hasbro brands were scoring big at the box office. The entire industry was buzzing about the potential for Mask to be the next big franchise pulled from Hasbro's library. And just six years later, in 2015, after a second G.I. Joe movie, two more Transformers movies, Gem and the Holograms, and that Battleship movie, The Hollywood Reporter noted that Hasbro and Paramount had begun working on a shared cinematic universe featuring Mask, G.I. Joe, and Micronauts. And Visionaries. And ROM. A year later, Michael Chabon, Brian K. Vaughn, Nicole Perlman, Lindsay Beer, and a bunch of other writers were all announced as being part of the team working on writing this incredible crossover storytelling and branding opportunity. And just three years after that, in 2018, F. Gary Gary... <laughs> 
F. Gray Gary. F. Gary Gary? <laughs> the guy who directed Fate of the Furious was announced as the director for potentially the first ever live action mask feature film. F. Gary Gray will be producing along with Hasbro, aiming for a haul somewhere in the range of the 1.2 billion that Fate of the Furious took in. That said, no release date has been announced at this time. Mask, a former competitor, is now an ally of Transformers and G.I. Joe thanks to the magic of corporate acquisitions. It was a unique toy line in an era saturated with unique toy lines that refused to be left out of the renaissance of 80s properties. It was, and still is, a marvel of action figure and toy technology, a rare toy line that promised action, surprise, and fun, and delivered. And wrong. <laughs> that works. <laughs> than ever from Worlds of Wonder. It's a timeless tale about being forced to grow up too fast, having the burden of leadership thrust upon you, the weight of responsibility for your teammates, your family, and the most powerful weapon in the galaxy. In an unfamiliar place far from home, a story told through the lens of anthropomorphic superhero space refugee cat people. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Thundercats. We have previously covered elements of the history of Thundercats in an outdated format called 10 Things You Need to Know. While it allowed us to present a brief overview of Thundercats in general, it also skipped a lot of basic stuff. Thundercats began as a 130-episode animated series originally airing from 1985 to 1989, supported by an action figure line from LJN, a series of Marvel comic books, and lots of other licensed merchandise. It follows the adventures of a small group of feline humanoid refugees fleeing the destruction of their homeworld Thundera, Lion-O, Tigra, Chitara, Panthera, Wily Kit, Wily Cat, and Snarf. The Thundercats are a team of family in a sense. They are what's left of the ruling hierarchy of the planet. Searching for a new home out in the stars, they are attacked along the way by an evil group of mutants called the Mutants. Their ship damaged, the Thundercats take the necessary measures to save themselves and the future of their species. As the other Thundercats sleep in chambers designed to keep them in suspension for the years-long trip across the galaxy, Jaga stays awake to pilot the ship, sacrificing his own life in the process. Upon arrival at a new planet called Third Earth, the Thundercats must orient themselves not only to their new home, but to the revelation that Lionel, one of their youngest members, the heir to the Thundercats' throne, has prematurely aged 10 years due to a damaged suspension chamber. The mind of a 13-year-old and the body of a 23-year-old. Relatable, right? <laughs> And the Thundercats still have possession of one of the most powerful weapons in the universe, the Sword of Omens, which means the mutants are after them because their new boss, an undead sorcerer named Mumra, wants it real bad. Wants it real bad. Wants it real bad. Quit licker. <laughs> Thundercats was created by Ted Tobin Wolf, Leonard Starr, and Mike Jermakian. It was produced by Rankin Bass Entertainment and Leisure Concepts. Rankin Bass is the same Rankin Bass responsible for the classic stop-motion animated holiday specials dating back to the 60s. Leisure Concepts is the company founded by Stan Weston, creator of the 1960s G.I. Joe, Captain Action, Mego's World's Greatest Superheroes, and licensing agent for DC, Marvel, and King Features Syndicate. He's kind of a big deal. Ted Tobin Wolf grew up in an orphanage, put himself through high school, and married at age 19. He served in World War II, where he lost part of his leg in the Battle of the Bulge. He learned about mechanical engineering and became an inventor working for Westinghouse before applying that mechanical knowledge to toys. In 1981, he sketched out a concept featuring superhuman-animal hybrid characters. He showed the sketches to Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass, who brought in Stan Weston and Leisure Concepts to flesh out the idea visually. 
They contacted Leonard Starr, longtime writer and artist of newspaper strips and both Marvel and DC comic books, as head writer, establishing the foundation for the world and mythology of the series. Mike Jermakian of Leisure Concepts developed the look of each of the characters, including their weapons, vehicles, locations, and the Thundercats logo itself. Bernard Hoffer composed the music, including the iconic theme song, while Jules Bass wrote the lyrics. While Rankin Bass had experience in producing animation, most of their work was for movies. Thundercats was an attempt at a fully syndicated daily cartoon series. Development had to be fast and efficient. While there were dozens of characters to be cast, they settled on just six voice actors for the entire first season. Larry Kenny handled Lion-O and Jackal-Man, Earl Hyman was Panthro, Red-Eye, and the Ancient Spirits of Evil, Earl Hammond was Jaga, Mumra, Vulture-Man, Amok, Captain Cracker, Hammerhead, and two of the Burbles. Peter Newman was Tigra, Wily Cat, Bengali, and Monkeyan. Lynn Lipton was Chitara, Wily Kit, and Luna. Bob McFadden was Pumira and Chilla and each of them voiced a handful of other minor characters. The production was so efficient that it only added two more voice actors, Jerry Ann Raphael and Doug Prees, over the course of the consecutive three seasons. 1985 was the height of the 80s style multimedia marketing approach. You don't just make a show, you don't just make a toy, you make a show, a toy, a comic book, backpacks, stickers, lunch boxes, Halloween costumes, erasers, everything you can put that logo or those characters on. LJN Toys released a full line of action figures, Thundercats, Mutants, Berserkers, and more, each with their own signature weapons, many with battlematic action, a Switch-activated gimmick carried over from their advanced Dungeons & Dragons line just a few years earlier. Lion-O and Mumra went one gimmick further, each one possessing a light-up eye function powered by a battery-operated ring that plugged into their backs. Vehicles including the Thunder Tank, the Sky Cutter, and the Fist Pounder. Even Mumra's tomb and a huge Cat's Lair playset featuring a laser weapon mounted in the head with a firing mechanism you control, but watch out for the packed-in mutant attack vehicle which can return fire and blow open the doors. <laughs> Thundercats! We don't know, Master! Who's the cauldron will tell us? You will find the Thundercats at Burger King for a limited time only. Introducing Thundercats meal packs for your kids with a glowing light switch cover, a secret message ring, and two other Thundercats treasures, a different one each week. We must get them! Sorry, Reptile. Our powers work for good, not evil. Thundercats meal packs for your kids now only at Burger King. The third major arm of the rollout was a series of comic books published by Star Comics, the all-ages imprint of Marvel Comics. 24 issues were released over a three-year period. Meanwhile, a completely different set of comics were being published by Marvel UK in the UK. That series would also run for three years, but a total of 129 issues would hit the shelves. Thundercats was a global brand appealing to kids all over the planet. After one season, Thundercats was one of the biggest brands in the U.S. and around the world, standing alongside the Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Masters of the Universe. In 1986, Rankin Bass followed the same formula for an unofficial shared universe series called Silverhawks. Check out our video on that series if you haven't already. That same year, Thundercats attempted to flex their muscles at the cinema with a feature-length movie called Thundercats Ho! However, just prior to release, some of the juggernauts of pop culture that they were standing alongside took their movie to the cinemas and nearly killed off their entire franchises. Hasbro released Transformers and My Little Pony to theaters in the summer of 1986. They both performed so poorly that Hasbro took their G.I. Joe film straight to television as a five-part miniseries, and the Gem and the Holograms movie got shelved altogether. Taking their cues from Hasbro, the Transformers, and G.I. Joe, Thundercats was also cut up into a five-episode miniseries, kicking off season two in a near miss with financial insolvency. To this day, the movie has never been released uncut, plausible deniability that it was always meant to be this way. In 1987, Rankin Bass added a third unofficial shared universe partner with Tiger Sharks. 1987 was also the year that Rankin Bass' parent company and Thundercats distributor Lorimar Telepictures decided to take the show on the road, literally. With a traveling stage show featuring the Thundercats, the Silverhawks, and their special friends Gumby, Pokey, Tiger Shark, Street Frogs, and Karate Cat. Was it a case of executives drunk on power, flying too close to the sun, overestimating the demand for the product, or just a beautiful, terrifying relic of a bygone age? Who's to say, but is it canon? No, it's not. It should be, but it's not. <laughs> 
1987 also saw the release of Thundercats The Lost Eye of Thundera by video game publisher Elite Systems. If you owned an Amstrad CPC, Amiga, Atari ST, Commodore 64, or a Sinclair ZX Spectrum, you could take control of Lionel in a side-scrolling adventure to take the Eye of Thundera back from the evil Mumra. After 130 episodes, kids moved on. The ratings weren't there anymore. The toy sales weren't there anymore. The whole franchise was put into a kind of sleep chamber until those kids became young adults and started to get nostalgic for the things of their youth now that the world of adult responsibilities had begun to dominate their lives and they had some money to buy it all back. Thundercats officially returned to a narrative capacity in 2002 at Wildstorm Productions, part of DC Comics, which was all under the umbrella of Warner Brothers, where the rights to the Thundercats landed after Lorimar Telepictures became part of the family in 1989. A rare example of a prominent brand changing allegiances from Marvel to DC thanks to corporate shenanigans. A whole bunch of Thundercats comics would be published, including several prominent crossovers with other major characters like Superman and Battle of the Planets, but... Is it canon? No, none of it's canon. It's fun, don't get me wrong. Thundercats and Battle of the Planets, that's the kind of stuff that previously only existed on the playgrounds. But as far as official continuity, if there is such a thing with a franchise like this that has had more than one incarnation, uh, that's a no from me. Thundercats almost returned in a big way in 2008. Warner Brothers was developing a CG animated feature going back to the roots of the franchise, but updated for modern sensibilities. A two minute test reel provided a glimpse of what could have been. After the box office disappointments of Speed Racer in 2008 and G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra in 2009, Thundercats once again took a hint from its partners and aimed for television instead. In 2010, Bandai brought Thundercats back to toy shelves with new figures based on the classic series designs. Mezco Toys brought out large-scale figures in early 2011, and in July, Cartoon Network began airing the first new Thundercats animation in over two decades. This show was a darker, more mature approach to the Thundercats mythology, digging a little deeper with more continuous narrative structure. There were character arcs and a build-up to significant events. It was a rebooted mythology, but... Is it canon? I don't know, like, it was supposed to be two seasons of 52 episodes, but it was canceled after just one season of 26 episodes, so while there's a lot deeper characterization and motivations are different, it's an unfinished tale. But it looked really cool, so I mean, that's a toss-up. Maybe they'll finish it and this is the new standard, right? I don't know. Like all cartoons, the show was canceled after it failed to find an audience with either adults or kids. Adults that found the show weren't buying the toys. Kids that weren't watching the show weren't buying the toys either. I don't know much about the economics of the toy industry, but that doesn't sound like a formula that's going to last for very long. But no 80s property is truly gone so long as any one of them is still succeeding. Blame Transformers, I guess, because Thundercats came back again in 2020 with Thundercats Roar. Like Thundercats through the lens of the kinds of cartoons kids are watching today. Blame Steven Universe, I guess. Or Teen Titans Go to the Movies. That thing did $52 million worldwide on a budget of $10 million. Produced by Warner Brothers Animation, Thundercats Roar is a much more... lighter? Childlike? Humorous? Series? Than its predecessors? It was intended to be released on Cartoon Network, but as of this video, only two episodes have been released and they are only on the Cartoon Network app. So, is it canon? No, honestly, anything that has been produced since the original series ended is non-canon until a new series is A, finished, and B, released for people to watch. So, after consideration, Thundercats 2011 is not canon for now. And that's all we're going to say about both of those sequels. They're both worthy of exploring deeper in their own focused videos. They both have received mixed reviews from the fan base for different reasons, to say the least. We'll just leave it with this quote from Comic Book Resources' review of the first two episodes. Quote, Thundercats Roar knows what it wants to be, and a few pacing quibbles aside, it does it well. End quote. The original Thundercats animated series has been released on DVD multiple times by Warner Home Video in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2011, 2012, and then the complete series again just last year in 2019. You can buy or rent them from your favorite online video streaming services like YouTube, Google Play, iTunes, Vudu, or Amazon Prime. 
What does the future hold for the Thundercats from Thundera from Third Earth? They've managed to maintain a moderate degree of pop culture awareness thanks to licensing across a spectrum of clothing, accessories, and collectibles. Funko has released Pop Vinyl and Dorbs figures, and in 2018 a series of five POA figures similar to Mattel's Vintage Masters of the Universe line. In 2016, Mattel released a series of subscription-based Thundercats at the tail end of their hugely successful Masters of the Universe Classics line of figures, lion o Panthro, Mumrod, Jackalman, Pumira, and an SDCC 2-pack of Wily Kit and Wily Cat were released before Mattel canceled the line, leaving the team incomplete. However, in 2019, Super 7 picked up the ball from Mattel with their Thundercats classics, reissuing the figures Mattel produced in 2016 and finishing the team with Tigra, Groon, Muscles, Mumra, Jaga, Chitara, Slythe, and Captain Crackers. Super 7 plans to keep the world of Thundera going as long as possible in as many different forms as possible. If the full-size classic figures are out of your budget, maybe the five POA reaction figures will be good enough. Thundercats has been owned by Warner Brothers since the 80s. Where it goes from here is up to them to decide, but it remains one of the most popular brands born in the 80s that refuses to go away while simultaneously refusing to reach its full potential. While it may seem unrealistic now, after two unsuccessful reboots, there's still a chance for a third return to our Earth for the Thundercats. The earth-shattering success of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the late 1980s changed the course of pop culture history and created an entire subgenre of clones, copycats, and wannabes. Many would attempt to replicate the formula, but few could make a legitimate claim to the legacy of the heroes in a half shell, and only one of them deployed cattle ranching puns with such calculated volume and frequency as to redefine the English language as we know it. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa. Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa was a 26-episode animated series that ran two seasons in 1992 and 1993. It is to cartoons, toys, and action figures what the rump cap is to the sirloin, a very specific joke for a very specific audience. As the American frontier expanded to the west at the end of the 1800s, a radioactive comet plunged through the Earth's atmosphere and crashed into the surface with the force of a thousand cattle drives. That kind of collision must have done some damage, left a mark. The question is, is it canyon? No, the impact resulted in the raising of a literal skyscraping flat-topped elevation upon which a city in the clouds was founded. Moo Mesa, the southwest Mount Olympus, would serve as home to the new Gilded Age gods, a trough of anthropomorphized ranch life. Scorpions, pumas, dogs, rabbits, buzzards, all those that were touched by the intergalactic influence mutated into new life forms coexisting with their previous species. Cow boys, cow men, cow ladies, and cow cows. They all call Moo Mesa. A home. Before we go any further, for the purpose of this discussion, cow has two meanings. Cow has three meanings. One, cow means cow, which is to say that there are actual, regular, unmutated cows in this world. Cows as we understand them, female, domesticated, bovine. Two, cow means cow, which refers to the post-mutation, anthropomorphized species of bovine derivative creatures. It is gender neutral. Cow, in this case, can refer to both cows and bulls and any two-legged bovine creature that walks, talks, and calls Moo Mesa home. Three, cow is an acronym, C-O-W, which stands for Code of the West. This is the most important use of the word as it is the cow in the name of the show and the understood usage when a character refers to the cowboys. What they are actually saying is the Code of the West boys. After the comet crash and subsequent mutation, a civilization develops mirroring the American Southwest. Everything from banking to blacksmithing, farming to fashion design, entertainment to education, law enforcement to leather working. Is it cannibalism? If you're copying humanity, you're going to have to take the bad with the good. Corruption and crime are just as prevalent in this sample size society as they are in the world at large. Fortunately, there are those who will answer the call to protect the innocent and hold the guilty accountable. When Mayor Oscar Baloney and Sheriff Terrible, no, Dan, you promised you weren't gonna roll your eyes. When they attempt to use their positions of power and influence for personal gain or to take advantage of the less fortunate citizens of 
Cowtown. The Cowboys of Moo Mesa, Marshall Moo Montana, Colorado Kid, and the Dakota Dude are there to put things right. Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa was created by Ryan Brown. Brown earned his professional comic book chops starting on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics, first at Mirage Studios in 1985, and then later at Archie Comics after the Turtles went mainstream. In addition to working on Ninja Turtle comic books, Brown also designed several of the toys that would be included with the line of Ninja Turtle action figures produced by Playmates Toys. Hothead Scratch, Monty Moose, King Lionheart, Half Court Worm, Scumbug, Leatherhead, Ray Filet, Sandstorm, Mondo Gecko, Ryan Brown was well versed in the anthropomorphization of animals. In fact, you might say he was at home in this range. That experience would drive his affinity for these types of characters. Pasture, average artist, Ryan and writer Stephen Murphy would go on to create the Mighty Mutanimals, a spin-off series featuring a team of anthropomorphized characters from the world of the Turtles. Mighty Mutanimals was a legit in-world creation amidst a herd of competitors trying to do the same thing ever since the Turtles found fame in the comics world back in 1984. From adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters to preteen dirty jean kung fu kangaroos, from mildly microwaved pre pubescent kung fu gophers to geriatric gangrene jujitsu gerbils. From adult thermonuclear samurai pachyderms to cold-blooded chameleon commandos, from samurai pizza cats to battle toes. If it worked for turtles, why wouldn't it work for every other type of animal? Sure, there are those who look at cows the way they are and ask why. I dream of cows that never were and ask why not. The Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa cartoon was based on a line of action figures designed by Ryan Brown, produced by Hasbro in 1991. Brown then sold the concept to ABC Television, where it would be produced by Greengrass Productions and Mini Mountain Productions in association with King World Productions and FlexTech Television. Season 1 was animated by Gunther Wall Productions and Season 2 by Ruby Spears Enterprises. It aired in the United States on ABC Network on Saturday mornings, 13 episodes from September to December of 1992, and then again for 13 more from September to December of 1993. It also hit YTV in Canada where it would actually have a longer life where it aired through 1999, and despite not being renewed for a third season, ABC would continue to run the Cowboys through 1994 in the US and they would later pop up in 1998 on Toon Disney until 2001. The cast featured season animation voice actors like Jim Cummings as the Dakota Dude, Jeff Bennett as Colorado Kid, Marshall Bravestar himself, Pat Fraley as Marshall Moo Montana, and the Joe Piscopo as Sheriff Terror Bull. Tim Curry showed up as Jacques Lebeef, Brad Garrett as Longhorn Silver, Rob Paulson as Cody Calf, Neil Ross as Bat Blastigun, Michael Bell as Brewster Cogsbull, Sally Struthers as Bessie Bluebell, and Kate Mulgrew as Barbed Wire Babs. Not a Peter Cullen or Frank Welker in sight. Mark Hamill is listed, but to this day, no one knows which cow sounds from the show came out of his mouth. Mark, if you're watching, if you're heifer available for a call to discuss what happened with your farmer employer, we'd appreciate it so we can stable this discussion without reservation. The theme song tells the story of how Moo Mesa and the Cowboys came to be, everything you need to know to get started with an episode. It was performed by singer-songwriter Billy Dean and co-written with Verlin Thompson. Actually, kind of a big deal at the time, Billy had just scored his first number one song on the country music charts and toured with the Judds. Moon Montana, Dakota Doug y Colorado Kid están siempre listos para enfrentar a los malos Buffalo Bull y Jerónimo. ¿Quién será el enemigo enmascarado? Forma tu colección del oeste salvaje. Cowboys, otra excelente idea de New Toy. Hasbro's line of action figures that kicked off the Moo Mesa craze had 10 figures each with four points of articulation and a vehicle. About the same size, design, aesthetic, and functionality to fit in with the Ninja Turtles collection you had already built. Moo Montana, Colorado Kid, and Dakota Dude were supported in their law enforcement efforts by Geronimo Moo, Buffalo Bull, and Colonel Cudster. Together they opposed the Cow Bullies, Saddle Sore, Boot Hill Buzzard, and Five Card Cud. Scoff laws led by, of course, corrupt Sheriff Terror Bull. Each figure was packed with an accessory or two themed to their character, their legs incapable of movement but providing a sturdy base. The only vehicle in the line was the Wild West Iron Horse, a steam locomotive engine. With whistle-stop ears, red-hot scorching mane, the pull-string motor activates thunder and buck and stampede action. It had arrow-proof, waterproof protective boilerplate armor, jackknife suspension, chili powder pistons, and a one-of-a-kind weapon system. But... Is it Beanscape? 
Yes, the Wild West Iron Horse featured a Cano Beans cannon mounted to the cow catcher, mounted to the pilot on the front of the train. That's the wedge-shaped nose piece that knocks stuff out of the path of the engine to prevent accidents. With it, you can deliver a last supper at 250 meters per second. What a savory way to go. The Cowboys and Cowbullies were featured in a series of comics published by Archie Comics. Three issues of a miniseries from December of 1992 to February of 1993. That was followed by three issues of a regular series in March, May, and July of 1993. The boys would find their way to the arcade in 1992 with Konami's Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa. It was a corn-operated, side-scrolling, run-and-gun shooter type game where players could choose from Moo Montana, Colorado Kid, the Dakota Dude, and Buffalo Bull. Suspiciously similar to Konami's previous release, Sunset Riders, you could play by yourself or run full four-player corn op. Ryan Brown worked directly with Konami to ensure the fidelity to the source material. Unfortunately, the game does not appear to have been ported to any home systems. Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa were supported by all the things. Storybooks, coloring books, fruit snacks, lunch boxes, coin banks, plastic dinnerware, nightlights, watches, backpacks, shoes, sweaters, and if you're looking for a way to stay awake, give yourself a quick mental injection of horror with the Marshall Moo Montana latex mask with vacuum-formed cowboy hat. <laughs> Some of the episodes were released on home video in 1992 by Random House Video, however, it has not been officially released on DVD yet. If you look around, you can find it unofficially, but you didn't hear that from me. The only other option is to check out the episodes that have been uploaded to sites like YouTube before they're run out of town. In 2006, the denizens of Moo Mesa showed up on an episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Sort of. During the episode Home Invasion, which takes place in the distant future, the turtles find themselves transported to Moo Mesa via a hologram training facility like the X-Men's Danger Room or the holodeck on the Starship Enterprise. They fight several of the cowboys and cowbullies, which can be confusing if you know who those characters are. After all, wouldn't the turtles join forces with Marshall Moo Montana? Ryan Brown has been asked this question directly and explained that multiple characters were provided to the animation studio and were properly labeled as two good guys and bad guys. However, time makes fools of us all and deadlines more so. The crunch of production resulted in the misuse of character designs that had no real significance to the animators producing the cells for the show. The turtles were never intended to fight the cowboys, only the cow bullies. The lack of time meant that Brown wasn't able to see it before it went to air and there was no way to correct it once it was finished. And then they spelled his name wrong in the credits. What a savory way to go. The boys were back in 2007, Tales of the TMNT Volume 2, Issue 21 by Mirage Studios. After being transported through a wormhole, they find themselves in New York City where they team up with the Turtles to capture Terror Bull. They come back again in Issues 32, 52, and 58. In 2008, writer Tristan Jones was purportedly developing a new comic with artist Fernando Leon Gonzalez Jr., but it was never completed. At this point, the brand is kept alive by the fan community, which always has been and always will be enthusiastic about the adventures of anthropomorphized heroes and villains. <laughs> There is no Cowboys of Moo Mesa movie in the works. No remastered, super-articulated Ultimates from Super 7, right? Right. Okay. The mainstream legacy of the show didn't quite reach the degree of pop culture influence that their cousins, the Ninja Turtles, did. As Entertainment Weekly put it in a review of the show in 1992, quote, This animated effort about cowboys who are literally cows is a real bum steer. All told, Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa is utterly, er... Utterly dull kid TV, D minus, end quote. Technically, that is a passing grade, and in stake terms, the lowest passing grade is still an A, so well done, everyone. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott might take issue with Entertainment Weekly's characterization. His brother Thaddeus was named after a soap opera character. His other brother Jace was named after a grocery store clerk. And Rain Dakota Prescott was named after the Dakota dude himself. As his brother Tad explained his mother's process, quote, strongest bull was Dakota dude. Sure enough, she got a bull, end quote. In the fight against evil, there is no such thing as too many heroes. Great darkness must always be countered with great light. When corruption threatens to overwhelm us, we rely on those who came before us to show the way. Whether it be mutant turtles or radioactive moo men, always look for the helpers. Listen to their wisdom. The meaning may change, but the words are everlasting. Cowabunga, dude. Cowabunga, indeed. A thousand years later, hi -ho, hi -ho. the prince and Snow White are living in the suburbs. Hello. Hello. You're a clothing designer. No, I'm a princess. Aren't we all? <laughs> Mr. Tolkien.
story of Cinderella. And I said you used to date her. Your father never dated Cindy. Well, honey, actually... <laughs> mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Honey, don't ask. The Charming, Friday at 8, 7 Central. It is a story about a magical sword, the battle to possess it, and the man entrusted with it. Transformative in every way. Its creation changed the fantasy world it exists within, and the real world it could not exist without. It's a story about power, those who claim it, and those who are to blame for losing it. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Since 1982, Masters of the Universe has unfolded as an incredible world with layers upon layers of stories to be told, generations of new adventures and revelations, of its development, of its creators, of the characters and related merchandise. For this video, we're focusing on the creation and legacy of the original He-Man and the Masters of the Universe animated series. That said, there are things we can't not mention, like the original toy line and the live action movie starring Dolph Lundgren. And there are things that we could but won't be talking about in this video, like 1985's She-Ra, Princess of Power, 1990's The New Adventures of He-Man, 2002's He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, 2018's She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, and both 2021 Netflix series Masters of the Universe Revelations and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. We're gonna break the whole thing into many faceable parts and give each series their own opportunity to shine in their own videos. Eventually. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is a 130-episode animated series spanning two seasons from September of 1983 to December of 1984. It spun off a sister series, saved Mattel from bankruptcy, and changed the way television entertainment and advertising was targeted at children. And the kids loved it. Eternia is a planet far away from here, across space and likely across time, at the center of its own universe. A world where magic and science coexist to create fantastic machines of progress and weapons of destruction. A world divided into two realms, one of light and the other of darkness. The light is governed by the royal family, King Randor, Queen Marlena, and their son, Prince Adam, with his giant pet tiger, Cringer, and magical friend, Orko, by his side. The darkness is ruled by the evil Skeletor, who commands his minions from Snake Mountain. Prince Adam has a secret, though. He carries the Sword of Power, which he can use to transform into He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe, and Cringer into Battle Cat. With the help of Duncan, the royal man-at-arms, and his daughter, Teela, the four heroes fight on behalf of the Sorceress to protect Castle Grayskull, a mighty fortress and the source of fabulous secret powers. Masters of the Universe is a brand created by Mattel, an American toy company founded in 1945. In 1959, Mattel introduced Barbie, the toy that would become the face of their brand. In 1960, they became a public company. And in 1968, they introduced Hot Wheels, shifting the market with farther reaching implications than they knew at the time. In 1969, Mattel sponsored a 30-minute Saturday morning cartoon called Hot Wheels, inspired by their line of toy cars called Hot Wheels. Competitors like Topper Toys, who sold the Johnny Lightning brand of toy cars, complained to the Federal Communications Commission that Mattel was getting 30 minutes of free advertising time. The issue for some toy producers was a desire for a level playing field among companies promoting their products to the kids watching the shows. The issue for some toy consumers was concern that kids couldn't tell the difference between the entertainment part of a television show and the advertising part. By 1977, the Federal Trade Commission was moving from limiting advertising time on children's television to banning it altogether. Child advocacy groups wanted shows that were entertaining, educational, and uninfluenced by sponsors believing that it wasn't healthy for children to be exposed to commercialism like that. As if. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan appointed Mark Fowler as chairman of the FCC, and together they began deregulating the entire marketplace of children's television and the advertising related to it, paving the way for cartoons to exist with the explicit purpose of advertising toys and the YouTube shows that decades later would exhaustively analyze them. In 1975, Kenner, instead of creating a brand from scratch, licensed the rights to the popular TV series The Six Million Dollar Man. This was the first time an action figure line was licensed from a television show and furthermore, succeeded in and of itself. Prior to this, toy lines that were associated with a TV show or movie tended to lose interest and sales when the movie or show was no longer being aired. Before home video existed, before you could pick where and when you wanted to watch a show, out of sight meant out of mind, meant no sales. 
So it should come as no surprise that Mattel, when approached by an independent film studio called Lucasfilm in 1976, declined to purchase the rights to produce a Star Wars action figure line, not to mention the unrealistic delivery target of Christmas 1977. Regular viewers of this show know that Star Wars was a very popular film and Kenner made a lot of money on tiny plastic people in spaceships. The industry turned upside down and Mattel had to play catch up scrambling for the Battlestar Galacticas, the Flash Gordons, and the Mork and Mindys. Mattel resolved to develop their own property. Mark Ellis, Mattel's new marketing director, big fan of Frank Frazetta and Conan, helped kick off the process by doing market research because that is the most important part of developing a toy line. The first goal was to figure out what the kids respond to, specifically boys aged 5 to 10 years old. Their research narrowed it down to space, army, and barbarian fantasy. Roger Sweet was a preliminary designer, the most important part of developing a new toy line. Roger wanted to develop a toy that stood out from competitors because it's bigger and stronger. Not with these spindly arms and legs, not with these passive faces and resigned postures. Roger Sweet, as he tells the story, imagined a powerful hero with rippling muscles, inspired by the artwork of Frank Frazetta and Conan. He took three of Mattel's big gym action figures and customized them to represent the potential action hero. One spacefaring, one armed to the military teeth, and one a barbarian warrior. Maybe it's all the same guy. Maybe it's different guys. He presented the idea to Mattel President Ray Wagner as He-Man, a name he says came to him in a moment of inspiration like a bolt of lightning after trying 40 or 50 other names prior to the presentation. The physical mock-up figures Roger Sweet created were supported by artwork from Mark Taylor, a product designer for Mattel, the most important part of developing a new toy line. Mark was a big fan of Frank Frazetta and spent his entire life doing drawings inspired by Conan, Tarzan, Prince Valiant, and John Carter of Mars. A lot of his time at Mattel was spent drawing things that may or may not become toys one day. Some of his drawings depicted barbarian heroes, skeletons and monsters, swords and sorcery and fantastic otherworldly landscapes. His characters, along with Ted Meyer's vehicles and Rudy Obrero's painted packaging art, established the foundation for the core characters and the tone for the rest of the line. Meanwhile, Mattel was approached by Conan Properties International, who were looking to get a toy line into production to correspond with the release of their movie, Conan the Barbarian, in 1982. Mattel obliged by developing a concept. However, before the film was released, Mattel was informed that the film was going to be rated R, a killer for a toy line aimed at 5 to 10 year olds. Mattel asked to be released from the obligation and understood that there would be a cost. They paid the fine and the matter was, for the moment, settled. Development continued on Masters of the Universe at the time called Lords of Power. Paul Cleveland was an engineer, the most important part of developing a new toy line. He determined the physical size of the action figure line as five and a half inches based on the cost of materials, the functionality, and the price point they were targeting. As director of marketing, Mark Ellis had one of the most important jobs in the development of this line. When he was asked by retailers how the story of He-Man would be told, he proposed the idea of mini comic books inserted into the packaging of the figures. Those initial stories and concepts one of the most important parts of the development of the toy line were written by Donald Glute and illustrated by Alfredo Alcala. The mini-comics put the characters into context, help flesh out the world and give some explanation to various artifacts and the good versus evil narrative. Eternia is a land ravaged by war. Fantastic machines litter the landscape as a jungle barbarian embraces the new power, weapons, and responsibility entrusted to him by the sorceress to defend Castle Grayskull against the evil Skeletor, a terrible creature who has arrived in this realm thanks to a dimensional rift created by the Great War. Skeletor wants to find both halves of the Power Sword to command the power of Castle Grayskull, which he will use to summon his people through the rift in space to conquer Eternia. We meet the other characters in the first few waves of figures and get a look at some of the vehicles and, of course, Castle Grayskull itself. Many comics helped tell the story, but regular sized comics helped even more, spreading the mythology without the upfront commitment of a figure purchase. On top of that, a partnership with DC Comics allowed them to introduce He-Man and his world with a spectacular battle against another very powerful, beloved superhero. In July of 1982, DC Comics published DC Comics Presents number 47, featuring Superman and the Masters of the Universe, written by Paul Kupperberg with pencils by veteran Superman artist Kurt Swan. Readers would be shocked to find Superman magically transported to Eternia, mind-controlled by Skeletor, forced to fight He-Man. That was followed by a bonus preview book inserted into 16 DC titles in November, the cover of that preview proclaiming that He-Man fights the mystic forces of the evil Skeletor with the timeless kingdom of Eternia itself at stake. 
A three-issue miniseries followed introducing several facets of the mythology for the first time, including the duality of He-Man and Prince Adam, as well as Cringer and Battle Cat, the royal family, and Queen Marlena's connection to Earth. The toys were first released in 1982. He-Man, Skeletor, Man-at-Arms, Beast-Man, Battle Cat, Merman, Stratos, Tila, Zodak, weapons and accessories, vehicles, and Castle Grayskull itself. A whole new world of adventure and mystery at a whole new scale, with new action features empowering imaginations around the world. Mattel was planning on sales in the range of $13 million. They nearly tripled it at $32 million, which attracted the attention of Conan Properties, who took Mattel to court, claiming that the idea was, essentially, stolen from them when Mattel had the license and failed to produce anything Conan-related. Now it seemed clear to them why. Hard to deny the similarities, not just between He-Man and Conan, but also between Skeletor and Thulsa Doom, and the fact that everybody who worked on Masters of the Universe was a professed fan of the characters and the series. That said, it didn't look like the movie. CPI claimed that Mattel acquired the Conan license to prevent anyone else from making Conan toys and to make sure that the fantasy barbarian market belonged to Mattel. Mattel assured them that they had been developing Masters of the Universe long before CPI even approached them about the license, and fortunately, the courts agreed. Come on, we haven't much time. We'll make it, we'll make it, E-Man. There it is, in that rock. Stand back. It's here, only at Burger King, a He-Man cup for your kids. Treat them to a different He-Man comic strip cup every week. Excellent. Or cups to collect and play with. To get one, just buy the Burger King meal pack. A hamburger or cheeseburger, regular fries, and a soft drink. Come and get me. Burger King. Mark Ellis, when presenting the line to retailers, was asked how kids as young as five years old were going to understand the story of He-Man. Yeah, it's great that there will be comics, but not all five-year-olds can read. Ellis replied that they were working on the most important part of the new line, a cartoon. The content of the show still had to fit U.S. television broadcast standards and practices, which meant that He-Man couldn't really use his sword to, like, murder and stuff, but thanks to the deregulation of advertising on children's television, there was no legal or market competition concerns about basing a cartoon on the toys like Hot Wheels back in the 60s. After a failed attempt to partner with Hanna-Barbera, Mattel found a collaborator in Filmation. Filmation had already produced a television commercial for Mattel late in 1982, featuring the core characters facing off at Castle Grayskull. Lou Scheimer, head of Filmation, big fan of Conan, loved the concept and agreed to do it if Filmation could have complete creative control. More than that, he loved the idea of keeping his animators employed on a show that was going to need 65 episodes to fill a 13-week schedule. Because Masters of the Universe wasn't going to be a Saturday morning cartoon, it was going to be syndicated. Scheimer helped build Saturday morning cartoons into what they were. In 1966, Filmation, along with Fred Silverman, produced The New Adventures of Superman, which broke up the routine of Saturday morning programming that was primarily reruns of existing animated shows like Tom and Jerry and The Jetsons. Superman was a licensed superhero at a time when superhero comics were experiencing a renaissance. Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, and the X-Men were all brand new comic book series, but Superman was still the most well-known thanks to the live-action TV series that ran from 1952 to 1958. Filmation and Mattel pitched Masters of the Universe to the major networks ABC, CBS, and NBC, but the networks declined. Daily syndication was the only choice left, a new approach to original cartoon programming, previously the exclusive domain of Saturday morning. An even deeper, more emotional connection to the audience was the result of Filmation investing in the mythology. In December of 1982, writer Michael Halperin, working for Filmation, had the most important job, developing the story bible. The line had grown out of visual concepts intending to create an engaging toy line, but the story changed with each new mini-comic, regular comic, or now cartoon. The Bible established a necessary, consistent history of the world, cataloged the characters and their powers, set a solid foundation. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe first aired in September of 1983, two seasons of 130 total episodes running through December of 1984. The theme song was composed by Shuki, Levy, and Saban. If you listen, you can still hear it in the wind. It starred John Irwin as He-Man, Ram Man, Faker, Webstore, and others. Alan Oppenheimer as Skeletor, Cringer, Battle Cat, Man-at-Arms, Merman, and others. Linda Gary as Tila, Sorceress, and others. Lou Scheimer himself voiced Orko, King Randor, Manny Faces, Zodak, and again, a lot of others. It was written by talented television writers like Larry Dottilio, Paul Dini, Mark Scott Zacri, and, um... J. Michael Straczynski. Masters of the Universe aired five days a week, keeping kids engaged in the mythology and keeping Mattel at the forefront of their consumer needs. Masters of the Universe established a very successful template, changing the media landscape for kids and the products they wanted to own. 
Within a year, it was airing in over 30 countries and over 100 stations in the United States. In 1983, it helped push Mattel's Master of the Universe sales past their goal of $65 million to $111 million. By December of 1984, the end of the second season, that number would push to nearly $500 million in sales. It was the most popular syndicated television program in the 2 to 11 bracket, with 30% of the audience being girls. Despite those numbers and the sales power it was flexing, it was not renewed for a third season. However, 130 episodes was more than enough to maintain its position in syndication for years to come. And Mattel was already beginning to expand the toy line to potentially appeal direct to that 30% of the audience that was young girls. Or maybe supplement the existing boys toys line with more female characters. I'm not sure who they were targeting and neither were they. In March of 1985, there was an official passing of the torch to He-Man's sister, She-Ra. A crossover film called He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword introduced She-Ra, explained her previously unknown connection to He-Man and Eternia, and relocated the story to the world of Etheria. He-Man wasn't gone forever, though. He and some of the other cast members appeared in cameo roles on the new series. She-Ra, Princess of Power, began in September of 1985. In November, both characters met again in He-Man and She-Ra, a Christmas special. The two series frequently aired together in one-hour blocks of programming, a new episode of She-Ra with a rerun of He-Man. In fact, He-Man would continue to air its 130 episodes in syndication through 1988 and then for two more years on the USA Cable Network. The real power of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe that all the brands wanted to possess cannot be measured simply in the profits from Mattel or the ratings for the television series. It was the power to appeal to consumers at such a young age, across media, unfettered from regulations prohibiting exactly that method. Was it bad? Was it wrong? Depends on who you asked. Child and family advocacy groups saw He-Man and the Masters of the Universe as the worst case scenario for their decades of effort. They saw it as explicitly a daily 30-minute commercial designed to sell toys directly to kids with no other redeeming value. Frank Orm, then president of the National Association for Better Broadcasting, an advocacy group whose motto was probably, won't someone think of the children, stated very clearly that He-Man and the Masters of the Universe would not exist without the tie-in to Mattel. It is pure commercialism right straight through. The creators agreed, in principle, that it wouldn't have existed without the Mattel toy line to spur its creation, but disagreed with the idea that it was A, bad, and B, meant that it had inherently no entertainment or educational value. The creators of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe had gone through great effort to instill the core morality of He-Man into their production. He-Man was created to be power, to share that power with children. More than anything, that's what kids were attracted to with He-Man. The ability to role-play some control over their world, over bedtimes, food selection, school attendance, the ability to override their tyrannical parents. He-Man is a good, caring person. He uses his power to help those in need, to fight against the forces of evil, no matter how ridiculous their schemes might be. Every episode closed with a recap of the moral message of that episode. Themes of family and friendship, belonging, diversity, and inclusivity. He-Man's success on U.S. television and in the toy aisle set the template for others to follow, and the entire market became a single, inescapable, blaring entity of daily televised 30-minute toy commercials for the next decade. G.I. Joe, GoBots, Transformers, Thundercats, My Little Pony, Rainbow, Bright, Voltron, Care Bears, Jason, Wheel Warriors, Rambo, Bionic 6, Brave Star, Madball, Sky Commanders, Spiral Zone, Starcom, Tiger's Gem, Mask, Robotics, Defenders of the Earth, Ghostbusters, and Humanoids, Laser Tag Academy, Popples, Pound Puppies, Silverhawks, Chuck Norris, Karate, Tiger Shutter, Teddy Ruts, Visionaries, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Sky Serpent, Strike Force, Cops, Dino Riders, Robocop, Police Academy, Captain, and Ring Raiders, and the Karate Kid. In 1986, sales fell, and in 1987, sales crashed. There is no single reason why Masters of the Universe sales dropped off so quickly. Despite Mattel's incredible short-term success with Masters of the Universe as a company, they were in a tight spot. In 1977, Mattel heavily invested in electronic handheld gaming. Successful at first, by 1983, Mattel posted nearly $400 million in losses. On the verge of declaring bankruptcy, they were bailed out by $230 million of venture capital in 1984. That changed a lot of decisions at the top. When Masters of the Universe began, there was a focus on keeping He-Man and Skeletor on the shelves for new buyers finding the line for the first time. Over the life of the line, that discipline had tapered off. An overstock of the background characters hurt. Squeeze isn't going to bring a lot of people into the line. They expect the high-tech toys to boost Christmas sales by 8% over last year. Yet sales are likely to remain flat for the year as a whole. The fall-off in sales of older lines was just too great. 
As a result, Standard & Poor's expects the biggest companies to show a ho-hum performance for 1986. Hasbro is expected to increase earnings by just three cents a share. Mattel is likely to see earnings drop by two-thirds, from a dollar to 35 cents a share. And Look, it's not fair, but the introduction of She-Ra changed the perception of the line. It didn't appeal to girls to the degree that He-Man had appealed to boys before it, and it didn't appeal to boys who were interested in getting toys that, for all intents and purposes, were designed for girls. Executives at Mattel made the decision to ship warehouses full of Masters of the Universe figures out to stores before their fiscal year closed out at the end of 1986 and 1987 so they could collect bonuses on the product they had moved. The value of the figures was declining as more and more stores marked down the overstock. Hasbro and other toy manufacturers had developed their own exciting toy lines and utilized the cross-media promotional tools Masters of the Universe had pioneered. After having been around for two or three years, kids were moving on to G.I. Joe, Transformers, Thundercats, Voltron, Jason the Wheeled Warrior, the <laughs> Nintendo Entertainment System had leveled up home video gaming to a degree that was unimaginable to kids at the time. Gobbling up all those extra gift dollars, Nintendo's slogan was, Now you're playing with power, He-Man! They took your thing! The final Doug Flutie Hail Mary attempt to save the line, when all the money was gone, was to shift away from the cartoon to produce a live action movie with characters that were essentially unrecognizable to the kids who had grown up with it. No Battle Cat, no Orko, and it took place on Earth. Masters of the Universe was released in August of 1987, produced by Canon, directed by Gary Goddard, starring Dolph Lundgren fresh off his appearance as Yvonne Drago in Rocky IV. The record will show that shooting stopped several times because neither Mattel nor Canon had any more money to pay the people making it, and Goddard had to essentially make up an ending to shoot because they couldn't do what they wanted to do. The toys that were actually released to tie into the movie were Gwildor, Blade, and Sorod, not, you know, He-Man. Or Skeletor. Production designer William Stout explained that when Mattel came to get the designs for the characters, he told them that no one had paid him for action figure designs, so no, they couldn't have them. Just great decisioning all around by Mattel. And just a few months after He-Man was released in theaters, in October of 1987, the stock markets around the world crashed in what is now called Black Monday, Black Tuesday in New Zealand. Why and what were the implications for Mattel and He-Man? I couldn't possibly get into it here. That's a story for our new channel, Finance Galaxy. What I do know, what I can say, is that Masters of the Universe had accounted for 94% of all profit growth at Mattel during its time on the shelves. 1987 represented a 98% drop-off in sales for Masters of the Universe, and no brand can survive that. Masters of the Universe was an all-encompassing media strategy. DC Comics produced Masters of the Universe mini-comics through 1985. In 1986, Marvel picked up the rights for the first ongoing Masters of the Universe comic, 13 issues including an adaptation of the movie, under their kids' imprint, Star Comics, sitting on the shelf shelf next to Heathcliff, Spider-Ham, and the Ewoks. The final issue was published in May of 1988. There was a monthly Masters of the Universe magazine, of which I still have several issues and a bunch of the insert posters. 16 issues from 1985 through 1988. A daily newspaper strip ran in syndication from 1985 to 1989 in the U.S. and papers around the world. Despite its struggle against the rising tide of home video gaming, He-Man and Friends appeared in their own titles. Masters of the Universe, The Power of He-Man, hit the Intellivision and Atari 2600 in 1983. Masters of the Universe, The Arcade Game, and Masters of the Universe, The Super Adventure made it to Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum in 1987. The Dolph Lundgren movie got an adaptation as well in 1987 for the Amstrad CPC, Commodore 64, and ZX Spectrum. FASA produced Masters of the Universe role-playing game in 1985 that could be supplemented with miniatures by Grenadier Models. Grenader models. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> That's a good take. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Fine. <laughs> the animated series was released on VHS and Beta at various points from 1983 to 1986. BCI Eclipse put out a complete collection on DVD in 2005. Mill Creek Entertainment re-released the entire series on DVD in 2010. For the 30th anniversary of the Masters of the Universe brand in 2012, Mill Creek released a 22-disc set of all 130 episodes, 20 episodes of the 1990 New Adventure series, and all 39 episodes of the 2002 He-Man and the Masters of the Universe series. In 2019, Universal Pictures Home Entertainment once again released all 130 episodes on DVD. It also includes both He-Man and She-Ra animated films, The Secret of the Sword, and A Christmas Special. As of this video, the series is available to stream on Amazon Prime and YouTube. A new feature film has been talked about for a very long time. The most recent version that was gaining steam in 2019 had Noah Centino as a potential He-Man. 
In 2021, it was announced that Sentina was no longer attached as he had moved on to Black Adam. And earlier this year, in January of 2022, Sony announced that Kyle Allen was the new He-Man and that the project was heading to Netflix instead of theaters, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Potentially the best home for it after the success of both Masters of the Universe animated series. Production is set to begin sometime this summer. There is currently no announced release date. Masters of the Universe was responsible for over a billion dollars in sales rocket-powered by the animated series. It was single-handedly responsible for the creation of a generation of toys, cartoon, comics, and pop culture that today is still thriving. For better or for worse, we are living in a future determined by Masters of the Universe. I've made a huge mistake. 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 You've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake. 40 years later, we can look back on it and see the positive and negative ripples that have flowed throughout pop culture, an historic legacy that several people claim to have been personally responsible for. The truth is that it could not have been created by a single individual. It was the kind of brand and power that could only have come from a collective, talented individuals doing their best work, professionals helping their teams excel, masters of their universe. Once you've experienced the intoxicating high that comes with being the most powerful brand in the universe, you'll do anything to get back to it. But where do you look for the answers as to how? In the future? In the past? Well, to get there as quickly as possible, we're going to need two things. A time machine and pants. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of the new adventures of He-Man. New Adventures of He-Man is a 65-episode animated series that originally ran in the U.S. from September to December of 1990. Meant to be a continuation of the original series, it takes place sometime after He-Man discovered pants, but before he discovered shirts. The New Adventures of He-Man brings us back to the world of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and its sister series, She-Ra, Princess of Power, this time in a new part of that universe on a planet full of new characters and new intergalactic threats. Far off in the galaxy, inhabitants of the planet Primus, the last survivors of mankind, are under attack from the evil mutants of Denebria. Or rather, they would be if it weren't for the planet-wide defense shield sustained by the Inner Council. One more attack by the mutants and the shield will collapse. Unfortunately, fighting was long ago outlawed and forgotten, so the people have to find someone else to fight for them. With that in mind, Master Sebrian and the four scientists of Primus have created a spaceship that can exploit a newly discovered temporary rift in time. This ship will allow two of the Galactic Guardians, Flipshot and Hydron, to undertake a dangerous mission to go back in time, to an era before the Inner Council when the power of the good and the way of the magic existed. Once in the past, Flipshot and Hydron encounter Skeletor, who convinces them that he's the guy they're looking for. Meanwhile, the sorceress tells He-Man it's his destiny to go to the future to save humanity. Prince Adam finally reveals himself as He-Man to his parents, King Randor and Queen Marlena, quickly followed by the news that he's leaving to fight crime in a future time. Bad news, no more He-Man and Eternia. Good news, no more Skeletor and Eternia. Flipshot and Hydron can't decide whether He-Man or Skeletor are the good guys, so they take both of them back to the future. The New Adventures of He-Man cartoon was created to support the new toy line produced by Mattel simply called He-Man. It was an attempt to reboot the Masters of the Universe franchise after its collapse in 1987, and boy did it collapse. It's a whole thing that we've covered here many times before. Mattel first introduced Masters of the Universe as a toy line in 1982. That was followed shortly thereafter by a daily syndicated animated series produced by Filmation in 1983. It was a magical marketing combo that established the template for how brands across the board would be marketed to kids through the 1980s. It made Mattel billions. In 1985, Mattel expanded Masters of the Universe from boys' toys to girls' toys. He-Man's sister, She-Ra, Princess of Power, took on the responsibility of carrying the franchise through 1987. And while that might have been a good idea on paper, the execution proved more challenging. With Princess of Power as the primary driver on television, repeats of the regular Masters of the Universe cartoon continued in syndication, and the toy line maintained a presence at retail. But sales were already on their way down, way down from the peak of $400 million in 1986 to $7 million in 1987. 
the 1987 feature film that was intended to take He-Man to the next level to save the franchise instead sealed its doom. That said, for all of its failure, the spirit of the film would carry on within the franchise. Characters like Gwildor would be rolled into Toy Line, and Frank Langella's Skeletor would set the tone for He-Man's rival in New Adventures. A final attempt to redirect the narrative of the toy line called Powers of Greyskull would have set He-Man's next chapter in pre-Turnia, the land of Eternia's distant past. It would have seen He-Man traveling back in time to meet the forebears of the powers that made him the hero he is, including the hero named Hero. Similar to He-Man, a young man named Grey could transform into Hero, the most powerful wizard in the universe. By placing his hand over his heart and speaking the words, magic and strength tempered by heart, I stand for peace, Grey could become the most powerful warrior in the battle against the evil snake men. But techno dinosaurs and a plethora of snake-themed villains wasn't enough to save the brand. The concept never made it past a few releases and a corresponding logo on the packaging. This hero and the Powers of Grayskull concept has a lot in common with another Filmation project that was in development at the same time and only recently uncovered by James E. Talk. Hero in the Land of Legends stars a character that, for our purposes, we will call Hero 2. Was this an earlier pitch made to Filmation, or an attempt to salvage the ideas from Powers of Greyskull is hard to say for certain. What we do know is that by 1988, He-Man and all of the Masters of the Universe were done. Well, with one caveat, done in the U.S., because He-Man had fans all over the world. And, thanks to the delays of international distribution, some by design, some just part of the logistical process, markets outside the U.S. were still clamoring for more He-Man. The final toys Mattel produced were released exclusively to that audience to reward that audience and simultaneously serve as a testing ground for new play gimmicks. Laser Light, Skeletor, and Laser Power He-Man carry on the tradition of different variations of those two core characters. From Battle Armor to Thunder Punch and Terror Claws, Mattel introduced different play gimmicks as a way to refresh He-Man and Skeletor on the shelves. Heavily influenced by the work of H.R. Giger, Skeletor's new look is a blend of technology and organic material. He is the embodiment of the ugly side of Eternia's magic and technology. He-Man uses magic and technology. Skeletor has become magic and technology. And not for nothing, but Laser Power he-Man has a variant head released in some markets that is thought to be a Dolph Lundgren likeness, which suggests that these two figures might have also had some connection to the 1987 feature film, or at least were influenced by it. Some accounts suggest that Laser Power He-Man and Laser Light Skeletor were being developed for a whole new line of figures that would have incorporated the illuminated crystal gimmick and thereby drive the storyline, which would have been supported by a new live-action television series not unlike the live-action series Mattel actually produced in 1987, Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. But that's not what happened. Mattel carried on fielding pitch after pitch, trying to solve the puzzle of the franchise's future. Another pitch from Filmation focused on the next generation of masters, specifically the son of He-Man and Tila, named Hero. This is a different hero from the hero of Powers of Greyskull or Land of Legend. For our purposes, we will call this Hero 3. In this Filmation pitch from 1988, according to an account by user Penny Dreadful on the He-Man.org forum, Eternia becomes endangered by an evil force which threatens to consume and destroy the entire planet. In an effort to save the infant son of He-Man and Tila, Man-at-Arms and Orca work together combining technology and magic to build a spaceship called the Javelon. Paraphrasing from Penny's post, He-Man uses this ship to send his son far into space and far into the future. Unbeknownst to him, Skeletor has also secretly stowed his own son aboard the ship in order to save the boy's life. When the Javelon crash lands, I think the planet here lands on is called something akin to Primus, but I can't recall the exact spelling. It is discovered by Darius, who names the baby Hero and acts as his mentor. Meanwhile, Skeletor's son, a product of his canoodling with Shadow Weaver, is found by Brack, who hands him off to be raised by a bunch of evil creatures and one day fight against Hero as Skeletine. It's not a dumb name, not any dumber than Snout Spout, Extendar, Squeeze, Manny Faces, or honestly, He-Man and Skeletor. What this pitch really illustrates is two things. One, Mattel was already developing toys that new character stories were going to be designed around. And two, one way or another, He-Man was going into space. Maybe he was going to time travel, maybe not, but his destiny was out there, in the stars, mastering the universe, if you will. Der böse Skeletor zieht jeden in seinen Bann. Jetzt seid ihr mein Erdlinge. Hilfe, wir sind in einer Falle. Doch danach He-Man, der Kämpfer für das Gute. Das Spiel ist aus, Skeletor. Keine Chance, du Feigling. Da kommt He-Mans neuer Held. Ich hab dich besiegt, du Schurke. Du hast es geschafft. Du bist der größte im Universum. Der böse Zauber ist vorbei. He-Man. 
die fantastische Kraft. Mattel was developing the toys and looking to Filmation to provide the story. Another Filmation pitch from 1989 called Masters in Space discards Hero 3 and Skeleton, recentering the adventures around He-Man and Skeletor, with Skeletor still heavily influenced by the laser light Skeletor figure. As discovered by James Etock, the series would have followed the adventures of He-Man, now Commander Adam of the Starship Eternia, traveling through deep space to confront the revitalized evil of Skeletor. In this version, He-Man and Skeletor have a climactic, climactic, seemingly final battle that ends with Skeletor blasted through a portal deep into space in the future. <laughs> Might be usable, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> now, with Orko at his side, He-Man can use a new computer device called RAM to generate a hollow projection unit to act as Adam when Adam is transformed into He-Man, and also he has a sassy talking sword. More importantly, the core characters are already here in toy form, waiting to find their actual identities. Darius, Hydron, Flipshot, Adam, He-Man, and the Starship Eternia roar through a series of high-action adventures that will take them through time and space across the frontiers of the universe. That version didn't happen either, because meanwhile, in 1989, Filmation was sold by its parent company, Westinghouse, to Paravision International, an investment consortium led by the cosmetics company L'Oreal. Just before the sale was completed, Westinghouse closed Filmation's studio and fired the entire staff, leaving only the Filmation library of previously produced television and films to be acquired in the deal. But Mattel still needed an animation partner, and that's when Jetlag Productions stepped in. Jetlag was the U.S. office of a larger animation studio called Creativity et Development, or Creative and Development, or simply C&D. C&D was the studio established by Jean Chalapon in 1987 after Deke Entertainment was purchased from him in a leveraged buyout by Andy Hayward, Bear Stearns, and Prudential Insurance Company. It's a whole thing that we've covered here many times before. The important part is that Jetlag gets the same offer from Mattel. Here's the toys we have already in production. Here's the very general story. You figure everything else out. Jetlag could have asked for the existing story bibles that Mattel had previously developed, but according to Jack Olesker, the head writer, story editor, and developer of the new adventures of He-Man, he and Jetlag chose to create their own original concept instead. Mostly different from previous pitches, yes, but all the important stuff was preserved. Time travel, techno-organic Skeletor, He-Man with pants. The new adventures of He-Man featured a more mature, more contemporary animation style, certainly evocative of anime at the time, and certainly evocative of another animated series from nearly a decade earlier that had also been more popular outside the U.S. than inside Ulysses 31. Not coincidentally, Ulysses 31 was produced by Deke Entertainment, the company that was purchased from Jean Chalapon in 1987 and a leveraged buyout by Andy Hayward, Bear Stearns, and Prudential Insurance Company. It's a whole thing that we've covered here many times before. Maybe New Adventures of He-Man was a thinly veiled shot at Andy Hayward and Deke, maybe not. Either way, it was an entirely new aesthetic from the visuals to the pacing of the series to the type of humor that Filmation had established with He-Man and She-Ra through the 80s. A definitive break from the original series that left longtime fans wondering why. This was all in service of promoting the toy line, and at the end of the day, Jetlag took its cues from Mattel. Beginning in 1989 and languishing on shelves as late as 1992, Mattel released nearly three dozen figures. From He-Man to Skeletor to Butthead. Hoove, Too Tall Hoove, Hook'em Flog. I honestly don't know if this stuff is real or if I'm making it up at this point. <laughs> Vehicles like the Astro Sub, the Battlebird, Bola Jet, and Doomcopter, the modular Starship Eternia that can be reconfigured into 12 different modes with multiple starbase configurations, itself highly reminiscent of Ulysses 31's three-part spaceship. A playset called Nordor, the Lair of Skeletor and the Space Mutants, a giant asteroid with a skull on one side that looks like an eyeball from the other. One of its main play features is a projector and screen to view two reels of animated scenes as though they are part of a giant view screen in the throne room. The line also featured roleplay toys like He-Man's Power Sword and Skeletor's Skull Staff, and two punch motion activated opposing gauntlets named Terror Punch and Thunder Punch. Like the original toy line, this He-Man line came with mini-comics to help tell the story before the animated series was released. Like the original toy line, the cartoon storyline was developed independent of the toys from Mattel. There are some minor differences in the mini-comics, and there are some major differences. For instance, in the cartoon, Prince Adam reveals his identity as He-Man for the first time to his parents, King Randor and Queen Marlena. In the mini-comics, he reveals his identity for the first time to Skeletor. The ensuing blast from Prince Adam's transformation into He-Man leaves Skeletor's body torn and broken. The mini-comics show us that Skeletor's new look is a reflection of the cybernetic repairs he undergoes to keep him alive and strong. 
The New Adventures of He-Man, like Masters of the Universe before it, was a vehicle for cross-media licensing, but didn't have the same reach or appeal that the original did. New Adventures never got the feature film treatment. The closest it got was a UK TV movie premiere December 24th, 1990. Not a new movie, it was just the first three episodes cut together, shown as a double feature with the 1987 Dolph Lundgren movie. Some of the episodes of New Adventures of He-Man were released on VHS. In 2012, Mill Creek Entertainment recognized the 30th anniversary of Masters of the Universe with a commemorative collection DVD set, 22 discs featuring all 130 episodes of the original cartoon, 20 episodes of New Adventures, and 39 episodes of the two 2002 reboot. As of this episode, New Adventures is available to stream in the United States on Peacock. The New Adventures of He-Man cartoon and the He-Man line of toys it supported didn't stick around as long as Mattel had hoped. But there was still some value to be had in the molds for the toys. Several of the figures showed up a few years later in 1993 as part of the Demolition Man toy line. He-Man is John Spartan, Flipshot is the Cryoclaw Tech, KO is Friendly, Visar is Blast Attack Simon Phoenix, the Bola Jet is reused and they didn't even change the name, it's still the Bola Jet. In 1996, Lou Scheimer was back with another pitch for He-Man and his adventures in time and space. This time, the action would focus on He-Man's descendant, also named Hero. For our purposes, that's Hero 4. Gretchen, stop trying to make Hero happen. It's not going to happen. Hero, son of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, was an even longer title than the original, similar to their previous pitch from 1988, but this time including a new alter ego named Dare for He-Man Jr. While still intended to be a continuation of the original Masters of the Universe storyline, it was not intended to recognize new adventures in any way. Scheimer has said that he gave Jean Chalapon his blessing to create the new adventures of He-Man in 1990, but he wasn't going to watch it or anything. In 2008, a new, new line of Masters of the Universe action figures was produced by Mattel, targeted at adult collectors, sold through a subscription model with no supporting media, Masters of the Universe classics revisited every figure in the original toy line, including those from She-Ra, Princess of Power, and eventually characters from New Adventures as well. 2009 saw the release of Hero from Powers of Grayskull, that's Hero 1 for our purposes. 2013, New Adventures He-Man complete with pants, ponytail, removable battle armor, and helmet. 2014, New Adventures Skeletor. 2015, Hero 2, that's Hero 4 for our purposes. Laser Light Skeletor and Laser Power He-Man. In 2019, DC Comics produced a six-issue limited series called He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse. It attempted to bring together the various timelines from comics, cartoons, movies, and action figures across nearly four decades to fight the threat of Anti-Eternia. Anti-Eternia He-Man is dimension-hopping, stealing the power of the various He-Mans, Grayskulls, and Eternias. The He-Mans that we know, including 1987 movie He-Man and 1990 New Adventures He-Man, and some that we don't know, must find a way to fight back against the expanding evil. The New Adventures of He-Man was an attempt to boldly take He-Man where he had never gone before, to a distant galaxy far, far away. Perhaps the toys didn't land with new fans who were finding He-Man for the first time. Perhaps the show didn't land with the legacy fans who had grown up with the original toys and cartoon. Perhaps it was trying to fill the void left by the departure of Star Wars from the toy shelves, but there was a reason Star Wars departed from the toy shelves. Perhaps it was simply time for the age of superheroes as the Ninja Turtles and Batman dominated the shelves. Or maybe Mattel could have had a hit on their hands if they decided to let Masters of the Universe take a break. Perhaps the new adventures of He-Man would have survived if it had been its own original toy line named anything other than He-Man. Thunder, Thunder, Thundercats. New Thundercats Lightning Sabers with Energy Pack Light Beam. New Thundercats Lightning Sabers on target the non visible light beam scores. New Thundercats Lightning Sabers make all Thundercats more exciting than ever before. Batteries not included. Energy Pack and figures each sold separately. It's a grand toy. A cartoon that looks like it's for kids, telling a story usually reserved for adults, never pulling punches when it comes to the realities of space war, the action on the front lines, the cost of conflict, and the tragedies that paved the way. A harrowing advertisement for a bunch of really cool toys, and somehow, Robotech Return. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of ExoSquad.
have covered ExoSquad before back in 2017, but there was a whole lot of information left out, questions unanswered, heck, questions not even asked. We're doing it again to tell a more comprehensive story about a revolutionary animated series with as much intrigue behind the scenes as there is in the series itself. Exo Squad is a 52 episode animated series that originally aired over two seasons in the US from September of 1993 to November of 1994. It deals with all the things you would expect a kid's cartoon to deal with. War, slavery, terraforming, pirates, revolution, death, revenge, cloning, entertainment, journalism, the legacy of 90s fashion, World War II, and mullets. Exo Squad takes place around 100 years from now, during a period of unprecedented human peace and prosperity, an age without hunger or want, after humans successfully expanded their reach to the next closest planets in the solar system, Venus and Mars. Terraforming these planets was made possible through an incredible scientific achievement, genetic engineering, and a horrible crime, slavery. The Neo-Sapiens are a species of genetically engineered, blue-skinned, intelligent bipeds designed to withstand the harsh environments of otherworldly atmospheres. Incapable of reproduction, they were manufactured to do the work that humans couldn't or wouldn't do. Are we the baddies? <laughs> The Neo-Sapiens rebelled, demanding a better life of not slavery. Shockingly, well, not that shockingly, the humans suddenly find the resources to invest in the tools and labor necessary to violently suppress the Neo-Sapiens. The result is first-generation E-frames, exosuits that give humans the enhanced strength, armor, and firepower they need to continue their dominance over the Neo-Sapiens. Meanwhile, deep in space, the pirate clans are looking for revenge, mobilizing their forces against Earth. The pirate clans are made up of generations of human criminals and their descendants, long since banished from the crime-free utopia of normal human society. Are we the baddies? <laughs> In an attempt to deal with the pirate clans once and for all, the Earth Congress deploys the full military might of the Exo Fleet to deep space. And that's when Phaeton, a brilliant tactician, the governor of Mars and leader of the Neo-Sapiens, makes his move. When the Exo Fleet returns, it is no match for the entrenched Neo-Sapien army. JT Marsh and Able Squad, a crack E-frame unit, must find a way to fight back against the Neo-Sapiens and restore human rule of Earth. The Neo-Sapien war has begun. Is this the last stand for the human race? Exo Squad was created in 1989 by Jeff Siegel, who had previously been a writer and story editor on shows like Super Friends, The Smurf, Challenge of the Gobots, and Sky Commanders. In the mid-80s, Siegel was knee-deep in an industry that was already saturated with robots and science fiction fantasy. But that didn't stop him from wanting to add to the pile, because kids couldn't get enough of it. Robots were hot. Robots sold toys. By 1989, toy boxes were already flush with Star Wars, Transformers, Gobots, Voltron, Roboforce, Mantech, Micronauts, Star Ears, and Robotech. Siegel had moved from being an executive vice president at Hanna-Barbera to being president of the newly founded Universal Cartoon Studios in 1990, where he continued to self-champion his creation at the time called Exo Force. Meanwhile, Playmates Toys was also looking to expand their presence in the boys' action robot market. In late 1991, Playmates was in talks with Universal Cartoon Studios about the possibility of partnering on a hard-edged robot license for the boys' action robot market. At the same time, Playmates was approached by Fossa Corporation, who were looking for a toy manufacturer to partner with on their flagship brand, Battletech. Battletech was a tabletop tactical board game utilizing mechanized war machines called Battle Mechs. Fossa was looking to expand into the boys' action robot market and presented Playmates with an assortment of literature to sell them on the concept. Things like posters of various Battletech miniatures and a catalog with all of Fossa's products. Playmates didn't want to rush into a decision on Battletech until after Toy Fair 1992 in February. Which hard-edged robot license would they pursue? With growing impatience in January 1992, Fasa offered Battletech to Tyco Toys with a similar package they had presented to Playmates. In March, after Toy Fair, Playmates requested more Battletech materials from Fasa. In April, according to court documents, which we will come back to, Playmates was actively developing mech designs for, quote, a very high-priority project involving the construction of a large robot with tons of firepower. They wanted the robot to be humanoid in the fact that it would have arms and legs and a head area. Back at Universal Cartoon Studios, by mid-1992, ExoForce was well into development with a full Bible of characters, themes, and conceptual renderings for the humans, the Neo-Sapiens, and various E-frames. Will Minio was brought on board during a break in the production of Saban's X-Men animated series, ahead of its premiere in October. Will was a veteran of animation, and more specifically, animation that was developed to sell toys. When he arrived at Universal Cartoon Studios, nearly all of the development work had been done. What was left was refinement. 
Minio would be responsible for developing the concepts in the Exoforce Bible into actual characters, helping to design the way they looked and acted, and to influence the artistic direction of technology depicted in the show. As a fan of late 70s and early 80s anime, Minio was already invested in the serialized storytelling of Japanese shows like Mobile Suit Gundam, Space Runway Edeon, and Fang of the Sun Dogra three real robot series that dealt with war and space combat in a more realistic way than their super robot predecessors like Guy King and Mazinger Z. Minio would go on to develop the pilot episode in a great working relationship with creator Jeff Siegel. Universal gave Will and the other writers the freedom to take the stories where they wanted to as long as they kept it in good taste and could pass the standards and practices criteria of network programming. In May of 1992, which is technically after February, Playmates officially communicated to FASA that they were not interested in the Battletech license. Their future with the boys' action robot market would be with Universal and Exoforce. It is speculation on our part, but in October of 1992, Saban's X-Men animated series began airing and is likely the reason why Universal decided to change the name Exoforce to Exo Squad. Marvel's X Force debuted in April of 1991 and was one of the most popular comic books on the planet. Surely, Marvel, Saban, Fox, and Toy Biz would have attempted to protect their trademark on television and in the toy aisle against Playmates. In February of 1993, Playmates showed off Exo Squad for the first time to potential vendors at Toy Fair. Two months later, Tyco and Fasa came to an agreement as Tyco acquired the worldwide master toy license for Battletech. It was a big year for the boys' action robot market. In August, Saban's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers debuted. In September, reruns of Robotech began airing on the Sci-Fi Channel, and Exo Squad began running in syndication. The time has come. Crush them before they can regroup. The epic space saga continues. We rule the home world. Exo Squad faces its most awesome challenge ever. We can defeat them. Prepare for a spectacular outer space mega battle. Launch the assault. It's a universal confrontation. We've got to have Exo Fleet help. Join the all new Exo Squad. 6 30, weekday mornings on Fox 36. J.T. Marsh, the leader of Able Squad, was played by Robbie Benson, who you might know as Beast in Disney's 1991 Beauty and the Beast, as well as a lot of other things. Nara Burns was played by Lisa Ann Belay, who would go on to voice characters like Relena Peacecraft in the English version of Mobile Suit Gundam Wing, Endless Waltz, and Tila on the 2002 reboot of Masters of the Universe. Margaret Maggie Weston was played by Terrell Rothery, who would go on to play Dr. Janet Fraser on Stargate SG-1 and Celia Hudson on Nancy Drew. Wolf Bronski was played by Michael Donovan, and friendly Neo-Sapien Marsala was played by Gary Chalk. Exo Squad was supported by a comic book released by Topps Comic, literally a comic. Only one issue, numbered zero, was released. It acts as a prequel to the series, establishing the world the same way the opening narration does. The last page teases a three-issue series to be published in the future, but that never happened. The lone issue was written by Len Wein with art by Joe Staten, Bill Anderson, and Carl Gafford, with Michael Golden on the cover. Other merchandise included a board game released by Pressman, Sound Source Interactive, and Acclaim released the ExoSquad Interactive Movie Book CD-ROM for use with your Windows PC. Micro Games of America released the ExoSquad Handheld Electronic LCD video game. Exo Squad was only released on the Sega Genesis and the Mega Drive despite advertisements that suggested it was also going to be on the Super NES. Players get to control JT Marsh, Rita Torres, and Wolf Bronski in their E-frames. Gameplay format switches between first-person shooter, platform jumper, and fighting game. Heavy on cinematics, light on gameplay, clunky at best. Electronics Gaming Monthly gave it a 3.5 out of 10. Season 1 of Exo Squad was only 13 episodes, but the story and original aesthetic attracted enough viewers that it was picked up for a second season of 39 more episodes. As a syndicated show, that meant that it was not part of a specific programming block like Fox Kids or Kids WB. It meant that scheduling was inconsistent from one region to the next, and that it wasn't always on at the same time from week to week. Beyond that, the landscape of afternoon television was shifting. Larger networks were absorbing smaller local stations to produce and broadcast their own programs. As more programming moved to cable, a consolidation of kids' programming saw fewer options as networks chose more adult-oriented shows. Despite Universal's success selling Exo Squad across markets, the programming choices were out of their hands. When fans could find it, Exo Squad did well. When they couldn't, it didn't. And in those markets, it was impossible for new fans to find it at all. 
Season 2's final episodes raise the stakes on what would have been critical pieces of the third season. Deep in space, J.T. Marsh is helping to dismantle the pirate clan's base on the planet Chaos when he encounters some strange alien spacecraft, aliens that had been hinted at throughout the course of Season 2. The strange alien spacecraft either destroys, displaces, or steals the entire planet. Hard to tell exactly what happens. The important thing is that it demonstrates the immense power that these aliens have and that they are likely a threat to the homeworlds who have only just begun to settle into a post-war life. According to Michael Eden, story editor for Season 2, general discussions were happening for an expansion of the ExoSquad universe and the brand. Season 3 was being considered alongside a potential spin-off called Exo Pirates, and a feature film being championed by original creator and Universal president Jeff Siegel himself. Exo Pirates would have answered the question as to what happened to Planet Chaos at the end of Season 2, following the members of the Exo fleet who were on Chaos when the aliens displaced it to another dimension, or maybe just across the universe. Exo Pirates would have built up the dramatic return of the planet and those members of the Exo fleet back to the regular universe just in time to help turn the tide in the battle against the new alien invaders. The potential movie was even less developed. Universal executives wanted to see an untold tale from the Neo-Sapien War. The regular writers wanted to move forward. Playmates released Exo Squad toys beginning in 1993. Each of the main characters and their E-frames are represented. Like G.I. Joe, the file cards on the packaging for the toys provides a wealth of information to help flesh out the mythology. Figures were smaller than G.I. Joe, but similar articulation. E-frames and vehicles are highly detailed with ample play features, including launching missiles, removable fusion packs, a cyberjack that can connect to the figure, stickers that allow you to customize the battle damage, blueprints, ID cards, and more. There were light attack vehicles, space series fighters, neo-sapien warriors, jump troops, mini Exo Command battle sets including the Resolute Warhanger, Vesta spaceport with smaller versions of the figures and E-frames, and even a micro-series Resolute Warship with micro-sized versions of J. T. Marsh's E-frame. And then, and then, Robotech. It is possible that there was going to be an in-narrative reason for adding Robotech to the line. We may never know for sure. What we do know is that the Exo Squad rebranding and re-releases of the Robotech toys use the same molds as the Robotech toys that were released by Matchbox a decade earlier in 1985. With minor updates to coloring and decals, if nothing else, it was a treat for Robotech fans to be able to purchase the toys in some cases for the first time. The aesthetic design of Robotech was close enough to Exo Squad for reasons which we will get into now. I'm going to do this as quickly as possible. If you want more details, we have already produced a five-part series on the history of Robotech and a video on the history of Battletech as well. The short version. Robotech was created by Harmony Gold in association with Tatsunoko Productions in 1985 as a U.S. adaptation and amalgamation of three Japanese animated series. 1982's Super Dimension Fortress Macross, 1984's Super Dimension Calvary Southern Cross, and 1983's Genesis Climber Mospita. At the time, several non-Japanese companies claimed to own copyrights to various elements of Macross, including Ravel, Hasbro, Matchbox, Harmony Gold, and Fossa, each claimed seemingly as valid as the next. Each company willing to go to different legal lengths to prove that they had a valid claim. The legal fights between Hasbro and Harmony Gold over decades are both legendary and stupid. In 1984, Fossa released Battle Droids, the game that would become Battle Tech after Lucasfilm laid claim to the word droid. Battle Droids included designs from Macross, including the Valkyrie that had been licensed to Fossa by 20th Century Imports. Shortly after Hasbro released a redeco of a Valkyrie toy called Jetfire as part of their Transformers line in 1985, Harmony Gold infamously took legal action to enforce their claim to everything Macross related in the US. That same year, Harmony Gold partnered with Matchbox to release some existing Macross toys under the Robotech name and produce completely original toys based on the designs from Robotech. From Macross. Action figures, robots, playsets, and a full-size Valkyrie that the human action figures could fit in. Just about everything but the actual specific Valkyrie toy that Jetfire was made from because, technically, they did not actually own that. Matchbox was new to action figures, so the toys weren't quite up to the standard of other action figure lines. Distribution was shaky, so they weren't available in all markets. The shelves were flooded with more popular toys from more popular shows. Matchbox's Robotech shelf life was brief. Jumping forward to 1992, while Playmates and Taika were both talking to Fasa about potentially producing Battletech toys, Universal Plastic Toys Company sold Matchbox to Taiko. 
Did that include the 1985 Robotech molds and the rights that go with it? No, absolutely not. Harmony Gold was still a global rights holder to Macross and anything related to Robotech outside of Japan. They re-released the 1985 Matchbox molds for a short-lived line of Robotech toys in 1992. Concurrently, in 1992, Fossa was still utilizing various Macross designs in Battletech products, and Hasbro had long since stopped trying to produce anything that looked like a Valkyrie. Surprisingly, in 1994, Playmates reissued the Robotech toys as part of the ExoSquad line. At the time, none of the writers working on the ExoSquad cartoon were aware that a deal was being made to add Robotech to the brand. Season 2 story editor Michael Edens has said that he was surprised when he saw that ExoSquad and Robotech were being brought together, and that the writers would have been happy to incorporate stuff from Robotech if it would not tie our hands on what we could do with the ExoSquad side of things. On the surface, adding Robotech to ExoSquad seemed like a good deal for Playmates, inject new life into a line that was lagging due to lack of proper television exposure by associating it with a known legacy brand. For Harmony Gold, collect profits with little investment on toys that already exist and further cement claims to everything Macross related in the US. The problem was, FASA was still steaming over what they claimed to be ideas stolen by Playmates back in 1991. FASA thought it strikingly obvious that Playmates had been influenced by conversations with FASA about potential battle tech toys. In December of 1994, FASA initiated legal action against Playmates claiming copyright infringement. FASA's claim was based on two things as presented in the court documents. Quote, one, the heavy attack E-frame is a direct copy of the Mad Cat, a Battletech Omnimech. And two, the total concept, look, and feel of the designs, images, descriptions, characteristics, and other elements of ExoSquad is substantially similar to the unique copyrighted designs, images, descriptions, characteristics, and other elements of the Battletech universe. One specific thing, and in general, all the things. That said, despite what appeared to be a clear-cut case of copyright infringement to me, FASA lost, in more ways than one, because in January of 1995, Harmony Gold and Playmates Toys sued FASA for copyright infringement. Well, I don't know what I expected. Specifically, quote, that FASA has unlawfully benefited from the use of the Macross designs which are the subject of copyrights owned and exploited by Harmony Gold and its exclusive licensee, Playmates. In 1996, it became apparent that 20th Century Imports, the company that licensed the Macross designs to FASA back in the 80s, might not have actually had the rights to do that. FASA lost their claim to the designs, and in 1997 released a statement saying that everything had been settled out of court. The Macross designs would no longer be used in Battletech. Battletech lost, but did anyone really win? It would be another decade before Harmony Gold released another Robotech series in the US. Harmony Gold's business model was more about suing and collecting the settlements for perceived infringements than it was about producing any kind of original content or importing existing Macross merchandise. Got him! ExoSquad was off the air and Playmates stopped producing ExoSquad toys. FASA, the loser, was able to safely carry on with Battletech under a new edict that all mech designs must be created in-house and look absolutely nothing like designs from Macross, Dogrum, or Crusher Joe. ExoSquad would finally return to duty, kind of, in 2001 from a company called Replay Toys. Replay Toys was a Playmates company used to reissue old toys. They re-released several of the ExoSquad toys as a line called Tech Wars. Figures got new generic heads, E-frames got new paint decos, packaging had a new storyline loosely based on the ExoSquad mythology. This time, it's robots from the sentient humanoid ordnance commandos, or Shock, revolting against the humans instead of Neo Sapiens, and the E-frames are now called tech suits. The packaging also cites that the product designs based on ExoSquad 2001 Universal Consumer Products. Season 1 of ExoSquad was released on seven VHS cassettes after its original run concluded. Season 2 was not released. Some episodes from Season 1 were also released on Laserdisc. Prior to its release on DVD, some of the creators of ExoSquad hoped that a positive response to a full season release might be enough to get the ball rolling on a new ExoSquad series. In 2009, the 13 Season 1 episodes were released as a two-disc DVD set by Universal Studios Home Entertainment. That wasn't enough to get the series back into production. Heck, it wasn't even enough to get Season 2 released officially on DVD. You can find DVD sets of the entire series, but they are not officially licensed. As of this video, you can stream the entire series on Peacock for free in the United States. Your mileage may vary outside the United States. There is no current plan for the ExoSquad franchise that we could find, despite a healthy and active fan base hoping for its return one day. It is possible that we might see real live actual E-frames in combat before that time comes, but ExoSquad maintains its legacy as a compelling original animated series that didn't shy away from dealing with mature subject matter and the realities of war. 
Born from an era when robots ruled the toy aisle, inspired by concepts, characters, and creators from Japan, it helped lay a foundation for the arrival of anime just a few years later and a full embrace by the Western audience within a decade as series like Gundam finally arrived on U.S. television. Surviving litigation-infested waters to nonetheless give way to the passage of time and expiring interests, Exo Squad may yet return one day, ready, willing, and able. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Check us out on Twitch. This is old. Holy cow. Check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. And if you made it all this way through this compilation, first off, thank you. And second, comment with the secret code word, rude dog and the dweebs, so that we know you watched all the way to the end. Are you a rude dog or are you a dweeb? <laughs> I'm a dweeb. I'll be the rude dog. Got it. <laughs>